Good morning and welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Water and Power Commissioners. Today is Tuesday, October 24th, 2023. This proceeding is being broadcast on channel 35 and the exact broadcast times can be found by contacting channel 35. Board of Water and Power Commissioners, please stay present for roll call. Commissioner Katz. Present. Commissioner Lair. Present. President McLean Hill. Present. Commissioner McGraw. Present. Vice President Neiman Brady. Present. Five board members, a quorum is present. Madam President. Um, a couple things. First, I want to apologize for the meeting starting so very late. Neither um, I nor our Vice President uh, was in the building at the appropriate time. Her absence was scheduled and planned. <laughs> Mine was not, so I take full responsibility for the delay. Um, and will do my very best to ensure that this kind of thing does not happen again. I know everyone's time is valuable and uh, 30 minutes is unacceptable, so I apologize for that. <clears throat> I also want to take a brief moment to acknowledge the passing of a citizen of Los Angeles who was an incredibly special young woman and uh, a person who was also important and instrumental at this department, Cindy Montagues. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to talk about Cindy's passing, especially uh, because it is so fresh, although uh, we knew that she was struggling with a fatal illness. I will never forget meeting that 26-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, and in my mind's eye, she remains that incredibly exuberant, smart, fearless crusader for her community and for the city. Um, there is not much that I can add to the accolades that have been bestowed upon her over these last several um, weeks and months, except to say that she is dearly missed by her friends, by her family, and by her LADWP family. And uh, with that, I will uh, yield to Mr. Adams for remarks that he might have. Thank you, Madam President. Um, it was very tough news to hear of, uh, of Cindy's loss, and we know how much she struggled, but um, we were fortunate to be able to uh, celebrate her contributions to the city at City Hall a couple months ago. And uh, she was, uh, in her time here, it was not long that she spent here, but she made a, a huge impact. And there's a number of us working here now that were very close to her and, and worked with her a lot. Um, you know, personally, we worked a lot on Owens Lake and trying to, trying to slay the dragon of dust control. And, <laughs> and, uh, and she was such a partner. Um, I remember particularly being up in Sacramento one time, we were at the Chicory Coffee Shop, which is right across from the Capitol, and it was full of people. And there was literally one person in there that she did not know. That was it. And she could figure why she did not know that person. But um, she knew everybody everywhere in government. And uh, the best part was that she was also received warmly by all of them. And, um, and so being with her anywhere on business was an experience beyond just what the purpose of the, of the trip was, but because it was a chance to learn and grow and, and, uh, and see what collaboration looks like in action and see what, what the drive and motivation and, and, and uh, how someone who, who had, you know, could build such a rapport with people could really get things done. Um, I remember when the water bomb was being passed, um, she was up, you know, I, I don't know, I talked to her late at night and, and the next morning, three, four in the morning, she was making sure that there was enough money in the groundwater cleanup that we could have $300 million allocated to uh, Los Angeles for our work. And um, I mean, she was dogged about ensuring that, that our interests were protected. And um, so we, uh, I will miss her as a friend and we will miss her certainly, so many folks will miss her personally. And uh, um, so, but thank you for the chance to, to say something. I would, I do know that Arm has quite a few experiences that he might want to offer a couple comments as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, my, um, Personally, my life has been richer because of uh, Cindy and, and her personality. And uh, same experiences, you know, as we want, went to Sacramento, it took us about an hour to get from point A to point B because she stopped and talked to the gardener. <laughs> she stopped and talked to the security officers. She stopped and talked to the people that were cleaning the floors and the bathrooms all the way to the governor uh, would stop specifically to see her, and sh that's the person she was. And uh, We learned a lot from her personality and her humbleness and, and smartness, and 
humility and and the way she treated people uh, we were we were all uh, students of uh, her attitude and, and life and and how he she treated other people so it was a big loss to hear the illness at the beginning she she fought the illness with uh, with honor and respect and she kept the same positivity as if she didn't have the illness uh, all, all the way to the end when she was at the uh, at the city council she was still acting as if uh, nothing has happened to her um, we are going to miss her and uh, a life you. lived in full service with that, um, we will move to the bulk of our agenda. Uh, we will start with um, general public comment. Public comment is open. There are no public comment at this time. Public comment is now closed. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Adams, welcome home. And uh, you. <laughs> uh, your uh, General, uh, do your report uh, from the general manager and chief engineer. Thank you. I, I feel like I've been on airplanes a lot the last two weeks, but it's been for good purpose and just so the board knows. So I was uh, in Denmark with Simon on a trip hosted by the Danish government talking about green hydrogen. About uh, about two dozen people from across the United States went, including uh, Commissioner from CEC and the, and, and the PUC, uh, as well as CARB staff. Uh, it was a very valuable experience. and. Uh, told us a lot about what we need to be doing and what we need to be doing broader than we we're even thinking at this point. But uh, it was a great trip. And uh, and so been a few couple of trips since then, but it's good to be back home. Um, while we were there um, uh, on Friday the 13th, which is usually an unlucky day, turned out to be a very fortunate day for, uh, for California. President Biden announced uh, uh, seven winning proposals for hydrogen hubs across the country. Um, he originally put $8 billion aside, ideally for four hubs, and it went to eight hubs, and it was maybe 10 hubs. So anyway, they settled on seven and spent most of the $8 billion. Uh, California, uh, for its Arches hub, uh, will receive $1.2 billion, which along with a uh, hub in Texas are the two largest awards. Um, and this is, and the, the best thing about the Arches hub is it's, it's focused right here in Southern California, particularly in the Los Angeles region. And so California decided to, to, to put its efforts here close to home. Um, uh, and uh, when we got an award, I know that uh, Mayor Bass was uh, contacted directly by the White House and, uh, and to receive the good news. And uh, I know they had immediately had a press conference and uh, represented the department along with Gene Soroka from the Port of LA. Um, both agencies will receive a sizable amount of money for our projects, helping us toward uh, uh, a clean hydrogen future, which uh, in the long run really helps our ratepayers and helps us to get there affordably. Um, the, the thing about the hub in California is that it's, you know, there's, when we went back to DC to talk about this and to pitch this with DOE, um, you know, the, the look at the investment, the, the amount of money we're getting is, Probably less than 10% of the investments that are planned, but it's but it's it's the the cornerstone part that'll actually help get alignment between the different between enough projects to actually create a hydrogen supply, have a way to deliver that supply, and have end users for that supply. And we know from our standpoint that um, it's critical that that hydrogen economy develops because we we uh, while we're in the forefront of of uh, you know efforts to use green hydrogen, we know we have. Not only our scattergood plant, which is planned to be a hydrogen gas mix converting to green to full hydrogen as soon as technology is available, we still have our other three in basin plants. And the only way to to be able to rely on those in the future, as all our studies and the NRAIL study showed, we need to, um, and and then also replace the three coastal plants that that have once through cooling that have to be replaced, um, and then at the same time meet our our clean energy goals is to have a change in fuels. And so um, this is a, a huge step forward to, to bring that alignment and to help that hydrogen economy uh, to get there quicker. We, uh, if you think back when solar started on rooftops, it was very expensive. We had, we ourselves put $300 million into solar rebates for rooftops, and now it's a self-sustaining in, uh, you know, industry. So ideally, um, this kind of money throughout the country will help hydrogen get there on a faster trajectory. Um, we know that it can get there, but it needs it needs that federal push. So um, anyways, great great news for us. Um, a lot of Simon's folks were involved with this. Um, I did want to also uh, acknowledge Paul Habib, who's hiding back over here somewhere. Paul was instrumental in making sure that the department had 
uh, its hand heavily in this and that we will receive a, 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 a good share of funding as well as making sure that the arches application um, was something that would be uh, that would be accepted in DC and be successful. So I want to thank Paul for his efforts on this. He he really shepherded not only us but the whole statewide team um, uh, through to get to be successful. So thank you, Paul. Um, Shortly after that, uh, last Wednesday, we also received a uh, notice from Department of Energy uh, that we uh, got a GRIP award, pardon me, a grid resiliency award, um, $48 million from Department of Energy. Uh, and this is uh, uh, to help our grid flexibility and, and help resilience in the power system against the growing threats of extreme weather and climate change and ensure that all of our customers have access to affordable and reliable clean electricity. So this will help us to, to develop a single platform where we can manage distributed energy resources um, such as EV chargers, um, energy storage coming online, solar systems, and our demand response infrastructure. So we're, we're grateful to receive this. Um, uh, I was just back east with the, the head of uh, SMUD up in Sacramento as well. They received a similar award. And so we we're the two in the state that received um, nearly $50 million each to help uh, help make uh, clean energy and the integration of renewables and, and distributed energy sources a reality. Um, last week, or the, probably this week, Joe Romalo launched uh, two uh, new things on to efforts online. We have uh, two interactive tools that are help assign customers to better understand and manage their electricity and water use. On the water side, we have Water Insights, and the energy side is called Energy Advisor, and this will allow customers to track their water energy use uh, throughout their billing cycle so they can adjust uh, their use and manage your bill. Um, you know, we, because we bill residential customers every other month, it's difficult sometimes to react in time and to understand you know, by the time you get your bill, your your water and power use is kind of a thing of the past. So Water Insights, uh, the idea was piloted in 2015. It was now available to all single family residential customers. And we have an online porter, portal uh, for that. And we're, and then Energy Advisory Advisor Tool uh, provides data on at-home energy habits and a comprehensive report that customers can access along with tips to reduce their energy consumption. Pardon? And uh, we'll be pushing those out through bill inserts and and, uh, and other newsletters. Do we have a sense of how many people have signed up for it thus far? Let me ask Joe. Joe, do you want to answer that? I don't have a sense, but I'm sure Joe does. Yeah. We, can get, we can get that information. On the Water Insights, I think uh, we'll work with Terrence McCarthy to get that as well as on the Energy Efficiency side. Okay, it'd be know. great. Maybe the next board meeting just to see sure. how much adoption there is. Okay. All right, thanks. And then uh, lastly, at the, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, starting on the 26th, so that's a couple days, uh, through the 28th is the Society of Women Engineers uh, National Conference, and it's here at the LA Convention Center. So we will have a uh, significant presence there. We're sending a, lot, a number of employees to go participate in that, as well as we have uh, several employees that are speaking, uh, have speaking roles uh, to talk about their experiences and uh, to other uh, existing and future women engineers. Our recruitment services uh, will be there staffing a booth and providing online job interviews. And our uh, own chapter of SWE uh, will be showcasing uh, videos telling about the stories of women engineers here at the department. And so we're very proud of the folks that are going to be participating participating in that and speaking at that and representing the department and looking forward to those next few days at the end of the week. And then lastly, uh, Simon has one uh, management announcement he'd like to make. Yeah. Thank you, Marty. Um, um, I'm very pleased to announce the appointment of uh, Lynn Doan, uh, if you may uh, stand up, please, uh, as the executive director for power planning, engineering, and technology applications. Uh, uh, Mr. Doan has uh, an experience of more than 40 years with the Department in Engineering, uh, Design, uh, New Business um, and Service Planning, as well as delivery of large infrastructure projects across the power system. Um, uh, he will be overseeing the power planning, engineering, uh, uh, the external generation and uh, the new business divisions. And uh, we're very happy that uh, he's coming on board to the executive team. Congratulations, Mr. Doan, and uh, welcome to the executive. That, that would be my announcement. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> that's the conclusion of my report, unless there's any questions. Uh, questions or comments? Um, I just, uh, uh, Marty, thank you for, uh, for plugging SWE. Um, I would be remiss, though, since Evelyn is at the dais, not to give her an opportunity to talk about what a significant engagement this is going to be on the part of the department. I know that uh, that our own uh, chapter has been working really hard to make this 
really impactful, both nationally and as a recruitment effort. We have a, a, a number of things happening. So Evelyn, if you would just give us a little bit more, that would be great. <laughs> I would be honored to share my thoughts on this. I'm, it's been many months in the making. Uh, the efforts of many individuals of our LADWP Society of Women Engineers, uh, coordination with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office, all of our um, employment services and recruitment uh, professionals here, planning for many months uh, to make this a concerted, deliberate, and um, very um, thorough representation of the talent that we have here at the Department of Water and Power before the world, because we have uh, expectations of uh, somewhere around 20,000 engineers from all over the country wow. and the world coming to Los Angeles for the first time in over a decade. It will not return to Los Angeles for at least a decade. So this is a significant opportunity for LADWP and the city of LA really to shine before the entire uh, engineering industry and the world. Um, so we have um, five different sessions where we have LADWP speakers featured. We are hosting tours of our facilities. We are also, um, uh, like uh, Marty mentioned, we have a number of recruitment activities happening on site, but are also extremely grateful for the support of um, both the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office and the General Manager's Office and uh, everyone involved to get uh, coordinated to have over 160, I believe, over 160 employees participating at some capacity during the conference and representing the Department of Water and Power. Um, we have um, a real opportunity here, not only for us to showcase what the department does, but really to build brand recognition with candidates and talent from all over uh, the country and to really make an Im impact, positive impact as well, <coughs> with up and coming engineers who are still in the student ranks. So it is un. I am beyond <laughs> elated. <laughs> uh, so on behalf of uh, the uh, LADWP suite chapter, our executive advisors, Nermina Ruchich O'Neill from the power system, Heidi Hiraoka, chief of staff for water system, and the entire LADWP suite board, I just want to express my appreciation to this board of commissioners, to Marty, to Aram, and everyone else who has been so supportive of this effort for so long, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> um, I also would be remiss uh, if I did not um, highlight the uh, significant support from our communications team. Uh, they have been absolutely uh, supportive uh, for many, many weeks working with us, developing materials and promotional videos, including one that will be featured during the introduction to the closing keynote, uh, which will be a, a speaker from the Southern California Gas Company, but we have uh, secured a spot for our own, uh, very own Cynthia McLean Hill. Our board president will be introducing uh, one of the in, uh, introducing speakers for that closing keynote and putting LADWP front and center before the entire attendance of the conference. So I am very excited to uh, and look forward to participating the entire uh, length of the conference myself. Well, thank you for that. I just, you know, knew that there was a little more juice that could be added to the representation of what's happening at SWE, and I know that our own internal chapter has been working for months to uh, really capture this opportunity. So I look forward to attending um, and uh, really look forward to presenting the video, which we don't have queued up for today, but we do have queued up for today. The um, for those of you who were unable to make the opening uh, art exhibit downstairs for uh, that was installed in recognition of Hispanic Heritage Month, our communications team has yet again worked miracles and turned around a very brief video of that opening. Um, there will be another opportunity uh, where we will um, be hosting an artist uh, reception. I think it's November 9th, I think is the date, but um, invitations will go out for that. Uh, but in the meantime, if uh, our folks back there could uh, queue up the video, that would be great. De colores presente is an expression 
of the contributions of generations of Latinx presence and achievements on this Tongva land and beyond borders. It's my hope that this artistic work that we will see today and possibly the voices that we may hear through the artists that are represented will spark important conversations between us and among us and provide a deeper appreciation for the Hispanic heritage that is such an important and vibrant part of LADWP. super excited, in particular, about the map. That map is genius, and I can't wait for you to see it, and I encourage you to use it, a map that lets you point out the nation that your family immigrated from, the time of your migration to the United States, and the reason that you landed in LA. In that way, we can all be present in this exhibit. It was said earlier that there are folks here in the Department of Water and Power that are artists. If you just take a moment to talk to people, you realize we're more than our jobs. We are creatives in so many different ways. This is a moment where we would just take uh, a time for ourselves and celebrate the strength that makes us the city that we are. I am so proud to be amongst brothers and sisters and just celebrate this moment with all of you and having you here to kind of emphasize the strength that we have. And this is one of those that we need to take time and celebrate. And thank you for being here and, uh, and, and enjoying this moment together. And we at DWP talked so very much about our service. To all of you here who contributed to this exhibit, I want to thank you for your service to us and to the community of Los Angeles and to the world for making us all richer for making us all more human, for elevating us all together. Thank you so very much. Uh, that exhibit will be up through the end of the year, and it is comprised of both original and uh, replicates of works. One piece was actually created uh, for the, no, actually two pieces were created, or original works that were created for this particular exhibit. So we're super excited to put it up. There were hundreds of employees the day that it opened that came through, and uh, we look forward to um, continuing to showcase it throughout the remainder of the year. Uh, next, we will move to uh, introduction of motions for future consideration. Uh, I am not aware of any motions at this time. Uh, we will go to uh, comments from our ratepayer advocate. Uh, Dr. Pickle, do you have anything at this juncture, or would you prefer to hold? Uh, hold for questions or issues on specific items. Um, terrific. Um, then discussions with neighborhood council representatives. Do we have any... Statements? No, com no, com no community impact statements. Terrific. Uh, then we will move to consideration for items recommended for approval. A um, couple of things. I'd like to call item L5 and L6 have been called special, uh, which leaves us with items L1, 2, 3, and 4. Four for adoption. Uh, is there a motion? Motion to adopt items one, two, three, and four. Second. Uh, would you call the roll? Commissioner Katz? Aye. Commissioner Lair? Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Commissioner McGraw? Aye. Vice President Neiman Brady? Aye. Five ayes motion adopted. Uh, terrific. Um, then if we could move to management reports. Uh, and the first report up is regarding LADWP's biodiversity efforts. Um, okay. 
Thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to call up uh, Catherine Rubin and Maria Sasson to uh, give this report. I'll do just a brief lead in. I'm not going to read the pages and pages of notes, <laughs> but I will, I will summarize. Um, you know, so our biodiversity efforts are, are kind of unique in, in the utility business. Um, we find ourselves to be uh, one of a few utilities and maybe the only public utility that's taken on some of the biodiversity challenges. Um, uh, back in uh, uh, 2017, there's a city council motion that, uh, that highlighted the city's biodiversity efforts, particularly as it related to LA's Green New Deal and uh, looking at power resources and as we move to a clean energy future, how we make sure that uh, we protect biodiversity in the city of Los Angeles. Um, a lot of this focuses in some of what we do when we think about the, uh, the uh, um, uh, LA, uh, the equity efforts and, uh, and, the, and, and all the things that we're talking about that. Biodiversity has a lot to do with open space, has a lot to do with access to nature, has a lot to do with quality of life and, uh, and quality of the environment that we live in. And so um, this has been uh, kind of a quieter effort at the department. Uh, we are looking to following this. This is going to be a, kind of a summary of what we've been doing, what we've been reporting on. Uh, we do report to the city's uh, biodiversity uh, group. This uh, LA San is a keeper of all that information. We are also part of an EPRI study uh, going on nationally uh, with uh, other utilities called their Power and Pollinators Program. And we also uh, are part of the Carbon Disclosure Project. And so uh, we have taken on some efforts uh, to participate in this and, and certain projects throughout the city, which uh, Catherine and Maria will highlight. Um, at the same time, we are working to formalize a biodiversity plan and policies to present to the board uh, to make this more formal part of how we work, to make biodiversity a consideration in the projects that we deliver, how these projects impact the public and impact the, the environment in Los Angeles. We do have um, you know, so many properties that we own, and some of them are very natural properties, and a chance to, uh, to, to do some important work in those areas, um, uh, particularly uh, even the such things as carbon sequestration and, and other things that we can do. But certainly the uh, looking at the, the impact of our projects on the communities that we serve and the chance to, to improve the environment overall, this is, this is an, av uh, an aspect of that work that we want to more formalize uh, as we move forward. Um, I know that uh, Commissioner Katz is uh, you're on the biodiversity expert panel for the city of Los Angeles. And so uh, you understand you know, where this work goes and the meaning, the meaning of this work. Um, there are a number of other utilities in the Southwest area that we're increasing our participation with. Um, and we have a lot of partners in this working not only with EFRI, but also Department of Energy, uh, California State Agency, such, in fish, such as Fish and Wildlife, uh, Nature Conservancy, and other, other partners. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Catherine and to Maria to highlight what we're doing. And then this will be a lead into some specific efforts that we have at, uh, at uh, Chatsworth Reservoir that Helen Olivares will talk about. Thank you, Marty. And um, before we start, um, I just want to let you know that I am grieving <laughs> Cindy. And um, this was a big effort of hers. Biodiversity was her area. Um, so I just want to um, dedicate this to her and um, maybe all of you can help us get through this. <laughs> so um, the next slide, oh gosh, this again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, our outline here, we're going to talk about what is biodiversity, and as Marty uh, talked about, we're going to talk about our biodiversity efforts. Maria will go into the highlights and talk about our strategic land, uh, land holding efforts, and then we'll go into our plan and next steps. I just want to talk about the term biodiversity. So it refers to the variety of life on Earth at all its levels, from genes to ecosystems, and can encompass the evolutionary, ecological, and cultural processes that sustain life. And so what we do here, you know, in terms of our projects here at LADWP, the different types of industries, all of that impacts biodiversity um, along with invasive species. But the good news is, is that we can all do something to help this. And this also includes climate change, and that is we can change our actions. And so as we go through what biodiversity actually encompasses and how easy it is for us to take into our everyday actions that we do um, to help the environment and to help what's going on here. So that's the good news. So in LA, how do we define biodiversity? 
Well, here in L.A. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I should say not how we define it. <laughs> how it. Yeah, how we're looking at it at the level here in Los Angeles with the biodiversity plan. I apologize. Good and so we're looking at it at the plants and the animals and the ecosystem that enrich and sustain L.A. And in L.A., that is, a, there's a lot of different um, species. So Los Angeles is proud to be part of the California Floristic Province. It's one of 36 global biodiversity hotspots. And so LADWP, we manage over 950 parcels throughout LA County, totaling around 6,235 acres. And we're also the steward of an additional 470 square miles of land in the Eastern Sierras. So the city of LA um, interest in and commitment to biodiversity really started as Marty mentioned in 2017. It was actually a council file um, number 15-0499. And it, um, amongst other things, it directed LA sanitation and the environment to lead the citywide biodiversity efforts and to create a customized biodiversity index for the city of LA. So the bio, um, the LA SAN team put together an interdepartmental team. It composed of city staff from other relevant departments like the City of Planning and Rec Department, also LADWP. A biodiversity expert council was created. It's an invitation only group. It composed of some city staff, other agencies, experts from local universities like UCLA and other scientists. And the last and largest group was a stakeholder group. And this group includes excited and engaged community members, members of the environmental wildlife and plant organizations. And so these various teams have been critical to success in building consensus among our biodiversity um, plan. So we customized, they customized what they called the LA City by Diversity Index into three categories or themes. And one was the native species protection, two was the social equity, and then three was the governance and management of biodiversity. The themes or the categories, however you wanna look at them, are broken into eight indicators and 25 metrics. And this slide shows the eight indicators. They cover various topics from access to biodiversity to management of biodiversity. And collectively, they provide a comprehensive snapshot of the biodiversity in the city of Los Angeles. And now I'm going to um, hand it over to Maria. And she's gonna talk about our biodiversity report that we have submit annually. Um, we just submitted it last August of this year, and it has our goals in there and, uh, and what we're going to do going forward. Thank you, Maria. Thanks, Catherine. Um, good morning, commissioners. I'm Maria Cison Rosas, manager of corporate sustainability programs, um, and happy to present the next few slides also dedicated to Cindy. Um, we, will, we will be focusing on the three bullet points listed on the presentation outline. And just to recap, it's the uh, fiscal year 22-23 highlights of our biodiversity efforts, the strategic land holdings analysis, that uh, project that we underwent through with the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI, and the fiscal year 23-24 next steps. So what you're seeing here are uh, some of the activities in fiscal year 22-23. Again, as Catherine mentioned, highlighted in the report we submitted to LA San in August. There were more activities than these, but we wanted to just lay out the concrete examples of successful projects, and these are some of the biggest ones. Um, we also just want to report to the board that even if this is just our second year of reporting, um, we've made a lot of progress, um, both in the quality of reporting, the types of projects that we've completed since the first report last year, and also the number of employees across the department who are actively engaged and now play lead roles for the goals. For example, we only had three folks um, involved in the report last year, and this year we have about 14 employees um, across the organization responsible for various initiatives. So we're very focused on a lot of collaboration and inclusion in this um, biodiversity efforts. And these highlights include the public engagement event at Chatsworth Nature Preserve, and we'll hear more on that at the 
during the presentation next to this. We continue to partner with city plants to provide free trees that in turn create tree canopies to fight um, against urban heat island effects and encourage connectivity in urban landscapes. We also held events focused on biodiversity and the ecosystem, mostly led by our green team, including the annual pollinator party that was put together by EPRI. This was a virtual three-day event with a reach of uh, 2.3 million viewers this year. LADWP had a set hour in the day where we showcased a video featuring Commissioner Katz. Um, it, the video was done by our communications team um, and Commissioner Katz had talked about the importance of pollinators and equity uh, in our biodiversity efforts. It also showcased our pollinator nursery at the Valley Generating Station, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And also worth mentioning is that during last year's pollinator party, we featured Commissioner Lehrer at our Hollywood Reservoir. Both videos are available on YouTube and um, has gathered a lot of views and generated positive comments. And per EPRI, also one of the two of the most viewed videos. <laughs> We participated in the Clean Air Day event wherein we tied biodiversity, healthy soils, and food insecurity with the topic of clean air. This in-person event had over 600 attendees who learned about composting, integrating native plants into their home gardens, and the role pollinators play in our food supplies. We participated in EPRI's National Pollinator Dashboard, which is an interactive map that highlights pollinator efforts by various electric utilities in North America. And for training, several employees completed the California Native Plant Landscaper Certificate Program. And thanks to our amazing landscaping team, they continue to add projects that include pollinator-friendly plants and drought-tolerant plants at various DWP facilities as part of efforts to improve urban landscape connectivity. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is one of the examples of their amazing projects. These pictures are from our pollinator nursery located at Valley Generating Station. The significance of an underserved community is not lost. It's built by our uh, very own landscaping team under Tom Desmet, who's here in the room, and also Noe Gomez Romero, who's our landscape supervisor. Um, they're both here today. Noe's here in case you had any questions related to plant pallets at the nursery. Um, the interesting tidbit about this is that it used to be an unused piece of barren land, not too far from transmission lines, as you can see in the picture. Um, crews had to regularly maintain and perform brush clearance activities for fire, fire prevention. So um, inspired by our national collaboration on pollinators, they converted it into a nursery, which now grows native and pollinator-friendly plants that they transport plant to other DWP facilities. As an example, they availed of some of the plants for a nearby pollinator garden slash lunch area for employees at the transmission and distribution headquarters at Roscoe Boulevard in Sun Valley at the request <coughs> of Superintendent Graham Pease, who's also one of our staunch pollinator supporters. They also built a water feature, um, a small pond on the right of the slide, which uses recycled water. So it's a very nice conversion project by our our landscaping team that now attracts native bees, hummingbirds, butterflies, and insects, contributing to the biodiversity in this community. Can Next slide, please. About, can I ask you, so, where ahead. does the funding for this come from? So this was um, included as part of the regular funding for FY22-23. And, and so, group. yeah, so Marie and I have talked about that. So what's happened is that we spend a lot of money maintaining yeah. our properties. And so the decision was made where we could is to maintain them differently. Um, but one of the things that we want to do in a formal plan coming forward to present to the board is actually formalize this and earmark to accomplish specific projects. But this has been absorbed. Funding such as this would offset cost of brush clearance and regular maintenance. Mm -hmm. And so, but, this, but it's been a concerted effort kind of low key to just change how we're spending the money that we're spending, but we want to formalize it more so that we do more of this much more intentionally and across the board. Yeah, and industry-wide, there's definitely a challenge with sourcing affordable native plants. So I know other institutions, including us at UCLA, are considering creating nurseries to have that direct source for internal use. So I think it's a really smart um, idea that probably has a return. That's correct, and um, part of the justification too was that um, it sort of offset the budget for buying plants at nurseries. 
Um, another item we'd like to highlight is the strategic land holdings analysis with EPRI. This was an effort that started in 2019 at the direction of Marty and Nancy Sutley. It was completed in 2021, so it really became more of a COVID project. Um, and various groups from real estate, environmental, sustainability, power system, and water system participated. So just big picture, this really was a, a first of its kind project, and the purpose was to identify DW properties with ecosystem values beyond compliance obligations. And the objectives and outcomes are listed here. I'm not going to go through them, but briefly share that the next three slides are meant, this and the next three slides are meant to give um, a flavor of the robust technical work behind this. And LADWP won a tech transfer award through EPRI, and this work has also inspired other electric utilities to go through their land holdings analysis. Um, so this next slide, basically, the, uh, we use the EPRI proprietary process. They, they use a GIS model builder. Uh, we provided them with a list of land holdings an acre and above in the LA County. There were over 6,000 acres, nearly 1,000 parcels that they then plugged into the model to analyze spatial data, identify parcels with high natural resource value, and where uh, conservation actions could be beneficial. It's very appropriate for large, um, with utilities with uh, large land holdings. So the big, the pink dots that you're seeing here represent DWP holdings in LA County, including transmission lines. Uh, the project allowed us to better understand our land holdings and facilities, where are the opportunities for pollinators, where's the milkweed, where do we need more natives and more urban connectivity. Next slide, please. So this just shows at the very high level, general level, the various indicators by objective. There was a corresponding analysis and scoring and deep dive discussions for each of the six land holdings that were identified and how they scored. Next slide, please. So this one shows the parcels that initially scored highly in terms of supporting habitat and biodiversity. This was part of the identification process. It was a preliminary list. Not all of the high scoring parcels ended up on the final list. And that's because the, the group had more extensive discussions on the site rankings, discussions on opportunities analysis, what are the DWP objectives, where can we have more impact, and also a reality check to consider consider the reality of implementing various actions. So these discussions eventually led to the identification of the six projects, including Chatsworth Reservoir. Um, the others were Tahunga Reservoir, Lakeview Terrace, um, Lakeview Terrace, which is a 12-acre small environment close to the transmission lines that um, have opportunities for further bee habitat. Hollywood Reservoir, which is identified as a prime location for community awareness and engagement, and landscaping is now installing an eco-garden along the walking path um, to be completed by fourth quarter of this year. And then the two others are Encino Reservoir and Malibu. Um, so I just have two more slides, and, and um, these will highlight some of the goals that we listed in the bi biodiversity report submitted to LA San in August. Um, so just to highlight that we will collaborate with the Biodiversity Expert Council. Commissioner Katz is part of that. We will also part uh, as part of the biodiversity plan that Marty mentioned. We'll look at various aspects of employee engagement and training. We will continue to look at how we're incorporating biodiversity in our day-to-day -day operations and projects, work with communications on a web page dedicated to biodiversity, including implementing GIS and story mappings of sites and projects. We'll also continue to work with our partners, such as EPRI at the national level, given our co-chair role at the Power and Pollinators Program. We're discussing potential opportunities with other Western utilities who want to collaborate on the Western regional effort to support the Western monarch population. And then from the planning, next slide, please. Yeah, from the planning and resource perspective, we are identifying the gaps in resources, classifications that we may not have right now, but we think may be helpful to get us to the next level. Uh, positions such as urban ecologists or landscape architect and others that can help upskill and supplement the existing talent that we have. We're going to find opportunities to further highlight our equity efforts and continue to support access to nature and green spaces, especially in vulnerable communities. And finally, we'll help 
help drive the narrative and message that climate and nature are one and the same. We cannot address climate change without addressing biodiversity loss, and that DWP's efforts to address nature and biodiversity loss are also part of the larger equitable clean energy transformation. So that concludes um, my report. Um, thank you for that. Um, are there any questions or comments? Um, I have comments, but I'll allow or wait for questions if anyone has questions for the team. I think you answered some of my questions. Just first of all, I want to commend you for tremendous progress since our conversations about this and being on some of the sites. And so having the green team uh, on, on the tour of uh, the Natural History Museum, which is really I think meaningful in many ways. Um, the the whole notion, of course, you, the the question I would have had is how to really take it up that other notch in terms of a professional um, sort of uh, support um, because you're you're dealing with you know sort of little pieces and it is part of a whole. And I hear some of the locations that you've chosen, um, and I, I do worry about, you know, basically it being an equitable sort of set of transformations across the region. So with that, I just think it's, it's about opportunities and jobs um, for people as well as for, for, for habitat. So. We'll thank continue you. to do that, and thank you for your support, Commissioner. Yeah, and if yeah. I could add to that, you know, we have a we've done a lot um, since whichever year drought that was that we did an inventory and started replacing all of our lawns with drought tolerant landscapes that are beautiful, um, not all necessarily supporting biodiversity. And so this is another facet that we want to yes. weave in. As uh, President McLean Hill will remember, we did the the acceptance of the $19 million check. And uh, that front yard that we were in was not only a, a, a replaced lawn with native California garden, but it was, we'd missed the hummingbirds, but it was full of bees and everything else. And it, it smelled amazing. I mean, it just, it was, and it was, it was exactly what you'd want us to be able to do. And so we do have a lot of properties and presence you know, at, at receiving stations, pump stations throughout all communities in LA. And so, yeah. so one of the efforts would be as we raise these plants and have these plants is, would be to start changing things so that we can really support biodiversity in the local na neighborhoods as well. But yeah, that's, it's something that was why we want to formalize this last couple of years of experience now and really, really make a pitch to move ahead. And, yeah, and to make you. sure that we include trees as part of the biodiversity mm -hmm. factor yeah. and the urban forest and the maintenance and management of it, which we need to talk some more. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, I was ahead. simply going to say a um, couple things. Uh, first, I want to advance a Commissioner um, Katz's comment, just acknowledge the significant lift that she has put forward on these issues. And thank you also, Commissioner Lair. I know Commissioner Neiman Brady's been engaged as well. Um, it's interesting, uh, first off, it certainly reflects the diversity of this board as you start to look at the items that are moving forward. This is a significant piece of work and what the department has done thus far is terrific. Um, but I suspect and um, believe that the department can do much, much more. Um, anytime I hear that we are part of a, I won't say that, <laughs> let me simply say that this department at its best is leading efforts in the city and really pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. And I'm confident that um, in this context, it will do that. <coughs> um, Commissioner um, Lair mentioned making sure that we have an equity lens as we look at these issues, and I know that that is a significant objective um, on the part of Commissioner Katz as well. Um, when I say that this is a significant piece of work, we do not currently have a subcommittee of this board that deals with these issues, so we'll be establishing that today, led by Commissioner Katz. Um, and I look forward to uh, the work that will be taking place as we not only um, what did you say, it's sort of compliance level, as we sort of <laughs> yeah. level up 
beyond mm -hmm. compliance, beyond, compliance. Um, beyond the nice to do's to a really strategic effort to excel in this area of our work to maximize the possibilities, both as it relates to biodiversity, also as it relates to equity and inclusion in terms of thinking about how we open our spaces to others so that they can visit and, and benefit from the riches that are being developed. Um, and it's very smart to think about the, um, the nurseries that allow us to spend money that we're gonna spend anyway in a way that's smart. Um, and that bear dividends as it relates to other properties and also to lead by example. So I want to both commend the effort of the department, but I really want to acknowledge the leadership of our commissioner on this uh, on this front. And I got it. The photo credit is. I think we all need to level up <laughs> in terms of our commitment to driving a point home. But um, so with that, I will uh, yield to Commissioner Katz. Thank you very much, President McLean Hill. Um, I really appreciate that. This is obviously an area that is very um, close to my heart, and I look forward to um, you know enhancing the leadership at the board level and supporting the work that the department is doing. Um, I was too emotional earlier to say anything, so I, I want to acknowledge um, Cindy's passing. Um, she was definitely a, a friend and a colleague, and I got to know her later in her career, but was really honored to know her for as long as I did, and I know that for many here, she's an even closer and longer colleague, and I, I just want to acknowledge, Catherine, I know it's not easy to get up and present in front of the board when the grief is so fresh. I know you were very close with Cindy and her family, so... Thank you so much for being here and presenting this. I can't think of a better way to honor her legacy um, than the work that this department is doing in this area. Uh, DWP has the potential to lead not only in Los Angeles, but really nationally as a utility in this work. And I really look forward to updates on the progress of this plan. There, all of the initiatives that have been put forward will be very impactful, but I especially wanna highlight that the plan calls for DWP to identify land within disadvantaged communities and really look at ways to enhance access to nature. Um, biodiversity is really about the systems that sustain life for all of us. And um, as a sustainability professional, I've seen that within our field, many times people are focused on the global and um, addressing climate change, which does impact biodiversity in an enormous way. But sometimes there's been a gap in terms and a blind spot when it comes to local biodiversity. So I think this work is really critical to close that gap. Um, I wanna give a shout out. I learned from Tom in our facilities area that our groundskeepers, many of them have already gone through the California Native Plant Certification Program to be certified landscapers. And I really think it's very important for us to walk the talk that way and glad to hear that um, more groundskeepers will be receiving that type of training and modeling what we're asking of our residents in our own properties while also creating community access. I also want to highlight the piece about LA 100. You know, there are always trade-offs in this work as we solve these big global challenges. We also have to think of the impacts that our construction projects have, and I'm glad to see that they'll be developing some recommendations on that front to really integrate this work into LA 100. So mm -hmm. um, looking forward to hearing the specifics on Chatsworth next, and I'm just excited to support this work moving forward. And um, it'd be great to have an update in a year uh, to the board and updates, I'm sure, in between uh, <laughs> To me, I, I look forward to working closely with you. So thank you. Thank you. Any other thank questions you. or comments on this item? Then thank you so very much. Thank I appreciate you very much. it. And we will move to uh, L2. So Helen Olivares will present uh, a little drill down to the subject matter with Chatsworth Reservoir and the history of that, and actually now called Chatsworth Nature Preserve. So we'll <laughs> I'll let her discuss that as well. <laughs> All right, good morning, Madam President and Commissioners. Um, my name is Helen Olivares, and I'm a Managing Water Utility Engineer in the Water Operations Division Property Management Group. And I've been with Water Operations, and I've managed Chatsworth for 11 years now, um, of my 21 years here at the department. And she used to be a student engineer for me a long time ago. Used to be a student engineer for you. <laughs> <laughs> so the program works. <laughs> 
I am very thrilled to be speaking before you this morning to share with you Chatsworth history, uh, its habitat, our community engagement, and what its future holds. So Chatsworth uh, Reservoir slash Nature Preserve is located in the Northwest San Fernando Valley, and it's within the city of Los Angeles boundaries and owned in fee by the department. It's so tucked away in the corner of the valley that it's actually adjacent to LA County and Ventura County lines. Uh, before I get into the details of Chatsworth Reservoir itself, I wanted to zoom out for a second to discuss Chatsworth Reservoir's role in the system, which dates back over 100 years ago. So the schematic to the right shows the first LA aqueduct where it then connects to Chatsworth High Line at the Van Norman complex. Looking at the map to the left, the High Line then traverses westbound across the valley parallel to the 118 freeway, across Granada Hills, Porter Ranch, Chatsworth, and then eventually terminating into the Chatsworth Reservoir. So since the beginning of the planning of the first LA aqueduct, Chatsworth Reservoir was part of several sites to be used to hold surplus water during the winter and then for irrigation for the farmers in the San Fernando Valley year round. The first LA aqueduct was placed into service 1913. Chatsworth High Line was placed into service 1916. And then Chatsworth Reservoir was placed into service 1919. The photo to the left was taken in the 1930s where there was more of an agricultural scene than an urban development. <laughs> and you can also see uh, that the reservoir is full of water. <laughs> the photo to the right is a Google Maps, map screenshot taken present day. And you can see how much the valley has developed these past 100 years. But if you notice, the constant is that the reservoir property itself has not been touched amidst all that development surrounding it. So here's some reservoir construction photos. Uh, the photo on the left is a Chatsworth Dam construction site. Chatsworth has three dams and construction method used was a then accepted hydraulic fill method in which the soil was washed or sluiced into place and there was no mechanical compaction used. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the dam had low strength and very little ability to withstand an earthquake. And as you can see, we used a mix of organic and inorganic construction equipment. So we used steam <laughs> shovels and horses. The, uh, the photo to the bottom right. They're mostly organic. Yeah, well, mostly organic. Yeah. The photo to the bottom right is a full Chatsworth Reservoir. Now, I've managed Chatsworth for over a decade, and I've been there so many times, but to this day, it still, still feels a little odd when I see a photo of Chatsworth Reservoir full of water. water. Yeah. <laughs> also, fun fact, many Western movies were filmed at the reservoir. Can I ask you a question about the prior slide, um, the one prior that happened in the 30s sure. to the 23? It looks like the current footprint of Chatsworth is really just the reservoir footprint. Uh, Majority of it is the reservoir, and we also own uh, properties surrounding the reservoir footprint. And it looks like the 1930s photo showed a lot of land outside of the, the reservoir footprint. Did we not own that land? We own that land, yes. We own that land. So currently it is being utilized or leased to other parties, or did we sell it at some point? Um, I'll be discussing that, uh, but to summarize, there is a portion, 150 acres north of Valley Circle, that we license to Reckon Parks. Yeah. But, I, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't, this part you're looking at, I think she's the part that's, that's un, it's bottom? not used for farming. I think yeah. it's in private ownership, but it was never, never flat for farming. It's kind of hilly there. I don't believe we ever sold any part of the property off. It's about 1,400 okay, acres. Okay, that, that's yeah. really more there of the is, question. Yeah. If you look at the, the current footprint it's I see what you're saying because it kind of looks like the footprint of the reservoir but if you look closely you can see the border of where the reservoir was and kind of the mountains that are beyond it to the right mm -hmm. so it is the there is property beyond what was the reservoir footprint correct right right but the question that I was getting at was really had we ever sold looks like it sh looks like it shrunk yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but no. oh yeah we haven't we haven't sold any property just licensed to rec parks just a small portion okay. <clears throat> so Chatsworth Reservoir initial capacity in 1919 was 7,400 acre feet or 2 billion gallons. However, as the West San Fernando Valley continued to grow in population, the reservoir dams were reconstructed in 1931 to increase its storage. And so the storage was increased to 9,840 acre feet or 2.8 billion gallons. So from 1920 to 1950, Chatsworth Reservoir was primarily used for agricultural irrigation. And then from 1950 to 1969, 
It was primarily used as a source of domestic supply uh, due to the continuous growth in the San Fernando Valley. Unfortunately, since the initial purpose of the reservoir was for irrigation, when the purpose transitioned to domestic service, it resulted in many water quality issues. For example, since Chatsworth Reservoir was built on a gently sloping valley, there were shallow sections of the reservoir footprint. So in the summer, these sections uh, frequently grew algae and aquatic plants, and then during windy days, the wave action would stir up the mud in the reservoir. Because of these issues, the reservoir had to be removed from service every summer. And there were also issues with storm runoff. Because this is an uncovered reservoir and there was no surrounding drainage paths, the storm water would flow into the reservoir. So in 1969, Chatsworth Reservoir was drained to construct a project that would improve its water quality and to increase its storage. The scope included deepening the basin and constructing a bypass to convey stormwater flows around and not into the reservoir. And then there was also a scope to build a detention basin with the intent to make it a temporary and experimental ecological pond. Uh, and I'll talk about more of that later. But then during construction, something happened. On February 9, 1971, the magnitude 6.6 .6 San Fernando earthquake hit. And as you can see in these photos, the damage was very devastating. The photo on the top left is a lower San Fernando dam. Now this dam was also constructed via the hydraulic fill method, and you can see the extent of its damage. Um, side note, the upper and the lower San Fernando reservoirs were removed from service as a result of the damages caused by the San Fernando earthquake, and the existing Los Angeles reservoir was constructed in its place. So because of the damage at the San Fernando reservoir dams, the Division of Safety of Dams directed an across-the-board study on hydraulic fill dams. So an analysis of the Chatsworth Reservoir dams were do was done. The study concluded that if the Chatsworth dams were subjected to a major earthquake, the dams would not perform. The department would have to completely rebuild the dams. So a business decision was made to keep the reservoir empty, take Chatsworth Reservoir out of service indefinitely, and then reevaluate in the future since there were other higher priority projects, such as designing and constructing the new LA Reservoir, the new LA filtration plant, improvements to Silver Lake, Stone Canyon, and Franklin, Frank, Franklin Reservoirs. So over time, it became less feasible to make an, any improvements at all to Chatsworth. So it's been empty for 54 years. Okay, now I'd like to zoom out for a little bit and discuss the entire Chatsworth Reservoir site. The department owns over 1,300 acres, and that acreage includes the footprint of the reservoir itself and also the surrounding land. And I'd like to discuss four key elements that's of great importance. The first is the lime kiln. You see it on the uh, left side of the photo. The lime kiln, or calera, which is Spanish for limestone quarry, is one of the first few surviving structures of the 1800s lime industry. The calera was used to burn limestone as part of the European industrial process to make bricks and tiles. And this was an ideal location because of the surrounding oak trees uh, was able to fuel the calera. Uh, fun fact, the Chatsworth calera was all, uh, part of the construction of the San Fernando Mission and it's LA Historic Monument number 141 and California Historical Landmark number 911. Okay, let's move on to the Sacred Circle. So the Sacred Circle is a site for indigenous tribe members to gather and to pray um, and to hold sacred ceremonies. Uh, though this particular Sacred Circle was established not too long ago, about 15 to 20 years ago, it's a modern circle to support our present day sacred ceremonies, which I'll discuss shortly. Okay, the ecology pond. So ever since Chatsworth Reservoir was taken out of service, the department has initiated and participate in, participated in programs to support the environmental aspect of this land. So uh, we licensed 150 acres to rec, rec and parks for public access. And as I noted earlier, we also constructed an experimental detention basin or ecology pond. The ecology pond is a vernal or seasonal pond that collects stormwater from the surrounding neighborhoods to provide water for the wildlife on site. And during the dry season, most times the pond evaporates to empty. So what we have are several water guzzlers that also provides water for the wildlife on site. Though the initial intent of the ecology pond was temporary and experimental, 
the experiment was so successful in attracting a myriad of species of wildlife that it's become a very integral part of the nature preserve. In 2015, we conducted extensive work to restore the ecology pond. The pond accumulated so much sediment that it was nothing but a shallow body that couldn't retain any depth of water. So department personnel deepened the pond and made channel improvements to optimize the amount of stormwater collected. And because of this year's rains, the ecology pond has been the fullest it's ever been. Not called out here, but we also have a variety of oak tree groves on site. Uh, we have stunning 100-year-old coast live oak, scrub oak, and valley oak tree groves, and some we assume are over 200 years old. So there's always been great ecological and cultural interest at Chatsworth Reservoir. So in 1994, the LA City Council adopted ordinance number 169723, amending and changing the zoning of Chatsworth Reservoir to Nature Preserve. Then in 1999, the LA City Council under file 9624.13 requested that the department change the name of Chatsworth Reservoir to Chatsworth Nature Preserve slash Reservoir to reflect conformance with the zoning designation back in 1994 and to maintain the use as a natural ecosystem. The Chatsworth Nature Preserve is the city of LA's first and still only designated nature preserve. Now I'd like to jump into the rich habitat at Chatsworth. This is just a small sample of the myriad of wildlife observed at the preserve. We have volunteer groups who access the preserve twice a year to conduct field observations of flora and fauna, and they share that data and photos with the department. So the photo to the top left is a red-tailed hawk, which is an apex predator, and the hawk is feeding its chick. And there's about five mating pair inside the preserve, and one pair has actually been monitored for about four years now, and they've had over 30 chicks over that time span. The photo to the top middle is a western spadefoot toad, and it's a species of special concern, which means that this species is declining at a rate that may eventually result in it becoming a place on the endangered listing. I also wanted to point out the coyote on the bottom left, Usually, when we think coyotes, we think mangled and underfed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, coyotes. <laughs> um, but this coyote looks absolutely gorgeous, very well fed, and very happy and healthy. So in the earlier slides, I mentioned the ecology pond. The photos to the right uh, is a very full ecology pond, thanks to the rain earlier this year. And I also mentioned the oak trees. So the photos to the left um, are some of the beautiful oak trees that we have there. Um, not only are these trees magnificent, but they also play a very important role in the preserve's ecosystem. Not only do they improve air and soil quality, but they also play a key role in providing food and shelter for wildlife. So many times you'll see a downed oak tree at the preserve, but if you look underneath it, you're quick to find that it's still home to wildlife. So it's still part of the ecosystem at Chatsworth. Here's some more breathtaking photos at the preserve. You'll notice that most of the photos that I shared today uh, are taken by John Luker. John is from the Sky Valley Volunteers, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. And their mission is to promote healthy and positive stewardship of the local mountains and regional open space for education and habitat restoration. And you'll also probably notice uh, that I've shared some photos taken by our own Commissioner Katz. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to thank you, Commissioner Katz, for your leadership uh, with our endeavors at Chatsworth and beyond. So although the preserve is closed to the general public, we do provide limited access twice a year. Every April during Earth Month, since 2002, so it's been 20, 21 years now, we host an Earth Day open house on a Saturday morning. There was an exception this year because of the rain, so we hosted the open house in June, near the time of the summer solstice. We attract on average over 2,000 people a year, and the program focuses on the, the deep history of Native American tribes who once inhabited this land, including the Ventureño Chumash, the Fernandeño Tatavium, and the Gabrielino Tongva. So we integrate their culture into the program through sacred ceremonies, 
through storytelling and song at the Sacred Circle. And we also focus on Earth Day principles of raising awareness and support for environmental protection. We have on average 40 environmentally focused community groups uh, that have booths there and also guided nature hikes around the ecology pond. The second annual event we have is the Winter Solstice. We'll be hosting our third annual Winter Solstice this December. The Winter Solstice takes place on the actual Solstice Day at sunrise. So the event is on a much smaller scale since it takes place in the weekday in the early morning. We gather around the Sacred Circle and partake in Native American ceremony to celebrate the Winter Solstice. And then after the ceremony, there's a guided hike around the Ecology Pond. We're also engaged with community volunteers. As I noted earlier, the volunteers conduct a spring and winter survey of the flora and fauna inside the preserve. And then in addition to surveys, we also work closely with them on a variety of projects at the preserve. I work closely with this passionate group of envi environmental stewards for many years now, and they absolutely love and respect Chatsworth Nature Preserve. So earlier, Catherine and Maria discussed our biodiversity goals to protect, enhance, and restore ecosystems and reverse biodiversity loss for food security, climate stability, and health. And the opportunities at Chatsworth Nature Preserve absolutely supports these goals. As an operations manager who's personally responded to wildfires, the severe drought, then the sudden rain, and then most recently, Hurricane Hillary, which are extreme weather as a result of climate change, and as a mother of two young children, who's afraid of what the state of the earth will be like for their future. I'm thrilled to be sitting before you to present Chatsworth, its future and how we could help with the climate crisis. So the department has, uh, takes pride in environmental stewardship we've done at Chatsworth for many years, many decades. We conduct annual brush clearance to protect the property and neighbors from wildfires. And we also balance the urban needs with ecological needs. We built the ecology pond, did major maintenance on it a few years back, and we're currently obtaining permits to remove invasive tamarisks at the pond. However, we realize that it makes the most sense to have an entity that's better, better equipped to assess manage and optimize the preserve. And it also makes sense to provide access for scientists, for ecological studies, and for cultural leaders to get reconnected with the land that their ancestors once inhabited. Uh, of course, collaborating with the community is also very important. So we're currently working with the Resource Conservation District of the Santa Monica Mountains on a biological assessment of the entire site. And in addition, we're working with environmental stewards on educational and restoration projects. However, there's still a lot of potential at the preserve. Supporting and restoring native habitat and biodiversity, providing access for research, education, and tribal activities, and expanded stakeholder engagement can all be accomplished under a site management plan. So with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Uh, thank you so very much. This is a tough day for a lot of people, so thank you for being here. Um, are there questions or comments on this presentation? Um, I, I would like to just make a comment about your wonderful presentation. I was there at the event. I, under, I, I feel your emotion because I was there with my four grandchildren. And um, it was a very, very special day for all of us. And we got so much feedback from all the different community uh, organizations that were there with information, with stories, also with the tribal presentation, which was very special. So thank you for what you're doing. And uh, Roxana and Gabriel and Clara and Amos, talk about it all the time. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you. Other questions, comments? Any questions similar to last time? I have comments, but I want to make sure we answer questions first. No, this was fantastic. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, Helen, for your leadership on this and you know, passion for this. I think it really is about our kids' and grandkids' futures, and this work is so important. 
Um, Chatsworth is a place that's close to my heart. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in Van Nuys, but my dad worked in Chatsworth, so I spent a lot of time in the area. Um, it is a very special <coughs> property, and as a couple of folks have mentioned, I do serve on the Biodiversity Expert Council for LA City and have really looked at these resources for the whole of Los Angeles. And there are some unique habitats at Chatsworth that are not found anywhere else in the city of LA. So it's really a very special property and your work and the work of the community members, including Sky Valley, um, have really made a big difference in this property. And I look forward to seeing how this moves forward. I wanna comment specifically on the tribal relationships here. I just came from a conference where there was a panel of indigenous biologists that included uh, Tiana williams Clausen, who's a member of the Yurok Nation. And their tribe just led an effort and it was successful to restore the condor to um, their tribal area up there in Humboldt County. Um, what was really amazing about this effort is that it was tribal led and in full partnership with the government agencies that were responsible up there. And I think this type of work of engaging with tribal members in a way that is not you know, tokenizing or extractive, but really fully um, working together to try and restore these relationships is incredibly powerful and what we need to transform our world. So I know George is leading that subcommittee and work um, with DWP, and I really look forward to seeing those relationships grow. Um, there's a famous book, uh, more recent, called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, and I wanted to quote her today. Um, she says, action on behalf of life transforms because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal. It's not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting as we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. So this work is a really great start and will continue. Um, as President McLean Hill mentioned earlier, there's so much more to be done, but I really look forward to seeing that grow. You know, we are all here on land that was, um, you know, belongs to different tribes here in Los Angeles. And the way to restore some of those relationships for us as a nation of immigrants, um, which includes my family, um, another quote from uh, Robin, she said, becoming indigenous to a place means living as if your children's future mattered, to take care of the land as if our lives, both material and spiritual, depend on it. And I think that's what this work um, really encompasses. And I, I really believe that's true. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. I also grew up in Van Nuys, so oh, nice. <laughs> uh, Chatsworth is very special, and this project is very special for me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for your presentation as well, and again, to acknowledge the leadership of our commission members in, in, the, in connection with um, both this project and the previous report. Uh, one of the things that we've been very successful at uh, over the last few years, and that I look forward, thank you, Aram. Uh, to to uh, expanding in the context of this work is bringing different stakeholders to our table, both outside of this room and in this room. And the, um, the vision that Commissioner Katz and others have brought to this area is um, really insightful. And to think about how we really go about maximizing and reconnecting um, and building uh, the kind of quality, deep, um, substantive relationships around land management, land use. Um, the way in which we start to break down the silos, even within this department, so that we are looking at the relationships that we are investing in, in you know, in the valley and thinking about how we expand opportunity to visit and to, you know, to gain access to especially the kind of educational outreach that could be done at Chatsworth. I mean, these are all incredibly exciting opportunities and they also represent really how this department builds a stronger Los Angeles and serves its residents in the myriad of ways um, that we have the capacity and a unique capacity to embrace. So this is, um, it is important, it is humbling, it is meaningful, mm -hmm. and it is, again, uh, always um, a real privilege to sit in a space where you can see uh, your capacity to have deep and, and lasting impact on, you know, a community that we all 
are indebted to and love. So I just want to thank you all for this and uh, to uh, tell you that I can't wait to see what emerges through the collaboration of this department, the leadership of this board, the incredible work of the staff. Uh, all together, we get to accomplish something that seems at times so small, but that is really so impactful and so great. So thank you. May I say one, one other thing, just to add um, that I, I recognize also that, Marty, you've spent a lot of your career um, focusing on Chatsworth and advancing the efforts there and really appreciate that. And, and hopefully, while not wanting to rush at you, Helen, uh, certainly there's significant support from the board to move as expeditiously as we can towards the plan that you've uh, talked about. And uh, hopefully we can make some traction in advance of Marty's retirement, so. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And our final management report today is coming from security services. <clears throat> That's right, Arnold. Oh, uh, you and your crew. There you go. <laughs> Or good morning. Uh, good morning, and thank you. And I just want to say that I um, asked for this report as, in part as a follow-up. We've had a number of reports from security services, including a um, rather critical look at uh, this uh, area of our department in connection with its overtime uses, um, written by our uh, former inspector general at the beginning of the year. Um, I know that there has been leadership turnover and uh, really significant improvement and advancement in the context of security services. I also note that uh, we've had some uh, enlightening um, feedback in connection with a recent safety survey, a survey which suggested that our uh, employees in this particular area were feeling uh, a little demoralized, and I wanted to also raise that uh, issue as well. So I am interested very much in understanding both what is occurring as it relates to the priorities of our, our new leadership team and also uh, just getting an overview of what we can expect moving forward. Okay. I have to apologize. My voice is a little off today to start with, but uh, I just want to give us a little background on what we do and, and for the department. Um, our main responsibility is to protect personnel, infrastructure, and the well-being of the residents of the city of Los Angeles. Um, we have round-the-clock coverage of the patrol of city-owned facilities, reservoirs, and equipment. We assure authorized uh, persons enter buildings, yards, or other restricted areas that only authorize personnel. Um, respond to calls for service regarding theft, trespassing, medical emergencies, accidents, civil unrest, threats to employees or infrastructure, uh, report sabotage, record incident reports, liaison with law enforcement. Uh, we conduct security assessment, assessments and testify in court when needed. Uh, we provide security for film LA assignments, uh, manage the ID unit. Uh, these, this is the bulk of our duties, but it doesn't include all. There, there is vast amount of assignments that we do take care of are responsible for. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, we currently staff 80, 84 locations. Uh, we have bidded shifts throughout downtown, reaching areas of Castaic, south to Long Beach, and out to Victorville, and all on to. Currently, there are 17 special assignments. Those are staffed by proprietary security. And in addition to those, we have a con four contract companies that make up about 25% of our staff and they are covering 31 locations. The contract security meets the minimum mandatory SBE, DVBE participation requirement of 20%. Two of those companies, Patrol and Apps Solutions and Absolute are 100%. And, <clears throat> I'm sorry. And uh, universe, uh, Allied Universal and American Guard are committed to 20%. So some of our duties are patrolling facilities, either vehicular or on flight absorber duties on aerial patrols. 
Posts include, po uh, patrols include checks of posts for officer safety, um, proprietary and contract, we check them both. Uh, regular patrols of unstaffed facilities such as reservoirs, distribution stations, receiving switching stations, water tanks, pumping stations, as well as calls for service for, from our homeless uh, assistance and response team. We have a homeless assistance and response team? I do. Uh, I initiated probably about five, six years ago. <laughs> yeah. So we do go out and work with the city councils and when they have a department property that's in need of some assistance, we'll go out there and we'll meet with crews or uh, homeless shelter groups that come out in the city, uh, the district council offices and arrange to have those people move their house and then the mm. cleanup process. And these are people that are either on our property or right outside our property, is that? They're either on our property or attached to a fence line. Gotcha, yes. okay. Do the staff that respond to those incidents have special training in this area? Most of our training has just pretty much been hand on, yes. We have gone through some training with LAPD as far as homeless, uh, and we do work with them on occasion, especially when it's our property, LAPD will come out with us. Um, so we do work with different agencies, um, could be the sheriffs, could be LAPD, or other smaller agencies. So, but it's a very short and, staff right and now. And it sounds like you're also working with the city and various services as far on the advocacy side to help help connect these people to resources as well as just the relocation. Exactly, the uh, council district will reach out to us or we'll reach out to them and then get uh, homeless shelter um, groups to come in with us and work with us to move people. We don't remove them unless we have a place to put them. Excellent. Yeah. Um, going to our central monitoring station, this station uh, monitors all our alarms, our security cameras. Uh, we have the reverse 911 phone call system now Security requests for service calls, uh, dispatches security patrons, and monitors all radio traffic of those units and our outline posts, our officers are on their radio. What's so we reverse 911 calls? Reverse 911 is a new system we put in about a year, year to year and a half ago. Uh, so if someone here calls 911, it goes to the dispatch, LAP to dispatch, we can listen into that call. So we can advise them where that 911 call is located in this building and give those officers uh, direct instructions on how to respond. Uh, in the past, we, we had an 911 call here, we wouldn't know about it. And LAPD or LAFD would show up mm -hmm. and say, we got a call here, and we wouldn't know about it. So now we know exactly where that call is coming from, we can assist. And if there's any kind of misdirection going on, the operator in the CMS can chime in on the call and say, no, that's wrong, you need to go this, go here and we can cut the response time and for our victims or, or people in need of help. That, that's really excellent to hear. Do you have systems? I know a lot of our properties are pretty remote mm -hmm. um, and locating people, you know, staff member who has an emergency can be really challenging in those kind of areas. What kind of systems do you have for that type of coordination on emergency response? Like are staff trained to use three words, for example, or are there other apps or programs that you're using to make sure emergency personnel can locate people within these more remote properties? For our staff, we have an emergency button on the radios that mm -hmm. will locate them. Uh, for other department staff, they just they, they would have to tell us what location they're at and we'd have to go search or help search for them. Yeah, that's yeah. something that we're, we're looking into uh, improving. Yeah, there's some, I know, I think LAFD or some others, there's a app that does a three word uh, it's like a very precise GPS type location that's very easy to use. That might be something to look into for that. Or there's a few there's a few options that are helpful in those kind of remote locations. We run into this a lot in the Sepulveda Basin where I'm involved because a lot of people call 911 and then police have no idea how to yeah. locate them within yeah. the property. We've looked at geo geolocating people through a cell phone or radio for that reason. We have a lot of folks both in water and power, uh, particularly water like hydrographers are off on their own in the hills at a tank. Exactly. And, and addresses are pretty insufficient a lot of times. Or some of our big properties, like somebody said, I'm at Chatsworth Reservoir and there's, a, right. there's an address for Chatsworth Reservoir, it's 1,400 acres. Yeah. So um, yeah, so that's a, a gap that we've been working to try to, to, try to fix besides just regular check-ins. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Policy as far as, far as uh, keeping communications with those people out in the field is something we put forward. Um, let's see. So there's a couple of examples of uh, 
non-traditional security unit. We had the ID unit, which uses badges um, and working special details. <coughs> Let's see, this one, it was the Women's Career and Wellness Expo, and that's our ID unit on the left. Uh, we are planning on purchasing, or we're in the process of purchasing a mobile ID unit so that we can have a, a unit or an officer go out to Mojave and take new ID unit, uh, ID pictures for everybody out there once a year. Uh, because I know it's kind of a task for them to come down. We can send one person there yeah. and spend overnight and take 20 IDs instead of having 20 employees come down here. That can also work for our generation stations that are, are busy. We can come out, we can, if we have four or five employees and they need to have a picture of a new ID, we can do that instead of having them have to come back to the JFB. So it won't slow down any construction projects. Currently, we provide uh, security at 84 locations. Those are staffed by both propriety and contract, as I said. Uh, upgraded kiosks require minimum to modernizations. Uh, support services needed for all locations. This includes maintenance and services. SD SSD is developing a plan, one more time, uh, for schedule for upgrades and replacement of some of these uh, kiosks based um. on priority. Yeah, I, I actually did have a question about that. As you know, I uh, did join you on a, a brief tour of some of our uh, security, some of our locations and, and met with some of our uh, security staff and noticed that the kiosk and their workstations were significantly um, antiquated to say the least. And in certain places, there are you know things sitting on their desks that are so big that they can't see over them, equipment that's no longer functional. Uh, it looks like you know computer or some electronic equipment from the 70s. I mean, it's huge. Um, and I'm very interested in understanding um, you know when and how quickly those things can be rectified. Also, um, the, um, you know, that tape in the windows uh, because there's no shade or no, nothing that's protecting them from the sun that's coming in. Uh, it's difficult, you know, to uh, know that we are operating a, you know, modern utility with significant capacity and resources and then to see employees that are charged with protecting our assets. Uh, working in conditions that are significantly substandard. So I did want to understand that a little better from somebody. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. I guess I can speak to that. Uh, good day, commissioners. I'm Tom DeSmet, uh, Director of Facility Services. I'm not part of uh, security, but um, there is a considerable amount of attention that needs to be placed on these security booths and kiosks. So. Um, I'm now involved. We're going to be uh, we're going to be assessing all 84 for condition. So we we have three tiers. What we found is 11 so far. Uh, 11 major 11 locations with ma major upgrades needed or replacement of the booth altogether. 14 moderate locations and 34 that require minor upgrades. 25 locations have no uh, kiosk at all, and they're usually like, temporary in nature, where the security guards are actually sitting in a vehicle. So um, the goal here is to, um, is to get a full scope of what needs to be done in each location. And within the next 30 days, the goal is to uh, do a full assessment of the 11 major locations plus the 25 locations with no kiosk uh, to determine the, um, the solution. Now, a replacement, uh, a replacement booth generally runs between uh, 50,000 to 150,000, depending on the size and um, upgrades the booth needs. So um, some of the uh, examples here are on, on the screen. For example, like at the ECC, the booth needed uh, bulletproof glass, uh, certain visibility features. Uh, one of the, the picture on the right there shows a portable unit and we are going to be purchasing or renting some of those to fulfill the areas with no kiosk at all. Um, the uh, trailer mounted units go from 25,000 to 50,000 each. So once we, once we take care of all of the upgrades that we need, get them in place, the ongoing maintenance of these um, is obviously an issue. Right, right now we, we do serve 51 of these 84 with our custodial staff. 
um, and they're on either bid or non-bidded locations. The other ones, we need to figure out the staffing. And some of those are in very far um, locations. So uh, we Although will have to come up with- there were a number. I mean, when I talked to security services um, out in the field, there were a number that are you know, right here in the area where mm -hmm. there's no custodial service, which was a little disturbing. So like I said, I, I do have 51 right now that we serve on a, on a daily basis. So, uh, and, but keep in mind the security services, what they provide, they don't do any dusting on the desks or, or cleaning up of clutter. They generally handle the floors, either um, vacuuming or uh, mopping, uh, the bathroom cleaning if it has one, and then replacement of trash. So that's usually the extent of what they do at a security booth or kiosk. A lot of the um, security desks are in, on the internal in a building. So those get handled with the building maintenance on a daily basis as well. So, um, and then also the, um, the repair of these booths, some of them are in disrepair. Like I said, the window coverings are bad. Uh, they either need to be tinted to still provide full visibility for the security guard without blocking their view. Uh, some can be handled with a, like a pull down shade to block the sun at certain times of the day and still provide visibility for the remaining you know, um, view. So we're gonna be working on that. We're, we're dedicated to upgrading the service to make sure that, that all of them are not only getting uh, served through custodial, but also maintained. Uh, HVAC is a big issue, uh, you know, the locksmith. We have a lot of gate repair requests, uh, things of that nature, so we, we do have, uh, um, right now, 81 open tickets spread out over seven of our groups that we are. Is this a staffing issue? Is it an attention issue? I'm just curious as to I think how we find not, ourselves in this, in this space. I mean, they can answer. I think it's not been prioritized. prioritized. I think security has kind of suffered through and there hasn't been attention. And one of the reasons that the major facilities group was formed was to have this become someone's responsibility. And I think now this is just catching up with that. But before, a lot of times um, you'd have, you know, maybe uh, the, uh, the general construction group would eventually get a work order to make a repair or a uh, facility manager might put in for repair or wait for his own crews to be available. We didn't have a, a group dedicated to just maintaining our own facilities. It was always something that we did when we got to it. So Tom's group um, that was formed by Mike before him um, was specific, specifically to address these kind of deficiencies that we see elevators of Main Street, all sorts of things like that, where we have not paid enough attention historically to our own living space. I have, I have a, <clears throat> a question um, in terms of HVAC, because I was noticing, thinking, how do you keep that cool? Uh, you know, I would imagine <clears throat> that there would be an opportunity to, you know, put out there some kind of a call or do some research on some of these uh, sort of units that might have some kind of an overhead that perhaps through solar does the HVAC. So we, it's proof of concept for everything we're doing. And uh, I, I personally would like to look into it, but I think there's probably something out there that would save money on HVAC and, and just help with that shade. Um. The unit on the right does have a solar roofing on it. I see that. I and saw that. <laughs> that comes with, the, and then we'll have, we can have the air conditioning and the heater on instead of them yes. sitting in a vehicle yes. and running the vehicle yeah. all night and turning the vehicle up there. Yeah. And, to... and the other one looks a little nicer, but in the end, um, it's also bigger and doing more. So it's just about the roof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, oh, yeah. I got it. The one on the left does, it costs more. Plus, you have to put your slab and your electronics yeah, and stuff. Of course. But, but that will be needed for us to upgrade other features that I want to add to these kiosks as far as smart cameras and computers and connectivity yes. with security officers for their safety and, and to move us not just with standards in the industry, but to move us ahead of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely want to say I think this is really important and I'm glad to see the creation of Thomas Group. You know, we 
we are always attentive to serving our customers. And so I think there's a long history of maintenance and preventative maintenance for our power and water facilities, but it's just as important to maintain our offices and our random buildings all over the place that are supporting our employees. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad. I know it's gonna take some catch up, but you know, thank you um, for your leadership on this. I look forward to seeing the plan and you know, hopefully we can get to a place where we have a preventative maintenance plan and not just a reactive maintenance. So um, look forward to seeing that develop. Yes. Okay. Well, these are just some of the examples of what we've been uh, working in right now, temporary places. Uh, like Somar East is actually outside of the wall. Uh, so the officer, I would, in the future, we plan, I've talked to Tom about moving that kiosk behind the wall to give that officer extra safety. As you can walk up to this facility and uh, it puts my officer at risk. So we're gonna readdress all the facilities in our audit and we're gonna look at, at moving some of them or building some kind of fencing around them for their safety. Uh, nowadays, safety of security officers uh, is important to the department. Uh, usually, you know, I'm not, I don't wanna talk about bad things, but usually sometimes the first one to get knocked out is the security officer before someone to have bad intentions goes into for the employees because they're on the front line. This was a temporary uh, shelter that was put for us at Harbor Gen. Uh, it was meant to be temporary, but it's been there for a few years. Uh, they moved us to the Fry Gate from Island Street. So our kiosk on Island Street is abandoned and we've been moved here. We, these are the kind of updates I would like to see done so that we have a, a better working environment for my officers. This is Van Nuys Commercial. Uh, I know it's a temporary assignment. The, the facility was never built with security in mind, uh, but we need to go back and, and readdress where we house our, our officers uh, and the safety of those officers and our employees. So, uh, this is a mission statement I just uh, rewrote. I, wanna, I don't know if we wanna read through that whole thing, but I am open for questions. If anybody has any other questions about security and where we're at now. Uh, I have a few. I have questions about staffing. I'm curious about um, the actual, I, one of the issues that we had been tracking was staffing and how that related to assignments and things of that nature. So where are we with respect to staffing? I'm glad you asked. I have transferred uh, eight more senior security officers to supplement our patrol unit. Uh, I am. I just sent a, a bulletin over to Local 18. Uh, we're gonna ask for 12 more answers. Once they approve, we can put it out. Uh, when those 12 are in, we are going to promote 10 from within. Uh, those 10 are gonna be, I will put out for those 10 as I get the 26 new officers that I'm bringing in that are being uh, offered jobs today. Uh, I know four have declined, so we went back to personnel and said, can we offer the next four? The answer is yes. So we're going to bring 26 in. They should be in here by late November, early December. We've already uh, scheduled their medicals. So that will be coming soon. So by the end of the year, we'll have 26 more officers. Some of those officers will fill some of our special assignments. Uh, and then we'll be cutting some of our overtime that, that's used to fill those special assignments. And then finally, one of the um, things that I learned out in the field um, had to do with um, our security officers in um, our um, customer service facilities and their interaction with pets or yes. you know random animals that were being permitted to come into the <laughs> into the facilities I when security officer indicated that you know in addition to dogs he's had snakes and birds and mm -hmm. you know just a range of, of um, you know, members of the wild kingdom that <laughs> come into our um, into our customer service uh, uh, facilities, and that they were advised that they were required to permit that. Have we addressed that issue? It's both a safety concern for our employees. It's obviously a safety concern for customers who are you know have children or who themselves don't want to interact with a range of of animals as they are you know, using our facilities. Yes, we have. I worked with Mr. Romolo's group and we have put, we developed signage, uh, notifying people when they enter the building, you have to qualify as a, as a therapy dog or uh, 
also we thought made small little placards for officers to keep in their pocket and has the two questions that the people have to answer. It's just a little reminder. Their post has been updated and we've also scheduled training, uh, I believe at Temple Street for dog, dog bites that, that our meter readers take. I'm sending my officers to that. Hmm. So we have acted on that. Those signs, I believe are already up or were, were being put up as of late last week. That's yeah. good to hear. Yeah. I know um, I also recently met with Thanks. Tom and facilities to talk more broadly about integrated pest management, which is really about prevention and thinking about how we look at our facilities and manage, you know, access, food attractants and other things that bring animals inside where they don't belong. So I'm glad to hear that some of those efforts are growing as well. We also provide a, a robbery prevention training to our customer service uh, employees. That's done once or twice a year. Um, no, thank you for this. I, you know, just simply want to say that there are certain, you know, folks who almost fade into the background. They're so omnipresent. Wherever we go, we have security services. They are, you know, they are, they greet us. They are pleasant. They are, they do, you know, what they can to facilitate, you know, our movement and access. And they're an important part of our workforce. Um, it is uh, just critically uh, important, I think, to me and certainly to this board that all of our employees understand that, um, that we see them and that we intend to ensure that their working conditions um, meet a certain standard and that we aren't, you know, it's, there's, there's certain things that are in our face all the time, and so we are constantly uh, celebrating or acknowledging the efforts of those areas of the department and those individuals in the department. Security services isn't in our face all the time, although they're everywhere all the time. And um, we do want to acknowledge and to, um, you know, and to recognize their service and the most impactful thing that we can do is to ensure that they have the equipment and the uh, work conditions that are required for them to do their job in um, as professional a manner as they seek to. So I appreciate your work uh, and this report and look forward to um, some you know, steady progress on these issues. Are there questions or other comments? To that end, um, we've heard a lot about kiosks and office spaces, but are there any other pressing equipment needs that we need to be aware of? Vehicles, uniforms, tools that the uh, Security Services Department isn't getting? We are uh, actually moving towards electric vehicles. We do have these new Ford interceptors for patrol, but they don't do well on facilities. So I've already talked to John Smith about getting some electric vehicles that could handle kind of sitting in one area, or just not traveling very much. These are made for on the road. So I'm already uh, working on that. And was the issue resolved that was brought to the board before by an employee about some of the remote employees' communications equipment? Yes. Was that addressed? We okay. had multiple band radials installed in our vehicles. And we also have a new radio that we just purchased. We're purchasing 10. Uh, those radios will actually be able to cover three bands at one time. Hmm. So if we have an earthquake or there's civil unrest, we can monitor our radio, LAPDs or the sheriffs, depending on what area we're in, even Kern County. Those those have three bands that we can listen to at one time. The satellite, satellite photos. We, we also purchase satellite phones. So all our patrol officers go out every night with the satellite phone. They check it back in. We purchase nine, so we usually have three or four patrols a, a, a shift. They'll all have a satellite just in case they get called out to go out to a... Uh, a remote location. We also have a policy on remote location that um, I believe is scheduled for next week or the week after for our meeting confer with the unions so that we can push forward that policy. Thank you. And then um, I heard something about a delay in uniforms related to contracts and things of that nature. Do we have uniforms for everyone? Yes. Uh, that contract, or I added a specific pair of pants. We had to wait to get re or added to the contract. That was done, I think, the Friday before. So the, our officers will have new uniforms and, and more comfortable wearing clothes for our heat. Yeah. All right. Thank you so very much. I appreciate the report. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will then move. We've got, do we need uh, to take a quick break? Okay, <laughs> why don't we uh, break till 12.30, then we'll come back and do the last two items and go into closed session. Thank you. Good time.
Please maintain silence for the next 20 seconds. We will begin shortly. Please maintain silence for the next 20 seconds. We will begin shortly. Thank you. Madam President? Uh, are you going to call the roll? Sure. Uh, Commissioner Katz? Present. Commissioner Lair? Present. President McLean Hill? Present. Commissioner McGraw? Present. Vice President Neiman Brady? Present. Five commissioners, a quorum is present. Madam President? Thank you. Uh, we will now move to uh, management reports uh, that have been filed. Are there any questions or comments with respect to the filed item? Okay, hearing that. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Yes, um, related to the SCAPA. SCAPA. I have some questions. Yes. I don't know if there's anybody who's able to. Uh, uh, I can. Yes. Um, just in the attachment that was sent, there's a lot of, uh, first I just want to clarify 100% that this is just for one month of activity, this two, bill? Two months of activity, oh, July, July and August. And August. Okay, yes. it says two August, so I, I wasn't clear. Um, <clears throat> and so $12 million, of which there are a lot of notations here of um, the replacement contract through LAD, uh, DWP procurement process. I, and it was just not clear to me does that mean they will be replaced once the uh, contracts expire? And then, and what if anything on this list will continue to be retained by um, so on this GAPA post-contract expiration? Post-contract expiration, it shouldn't be going through SCAPA. So there are some subscriptions on here for Bloomberg that uh, oh, we'll be monitoring. Yeah, yeah. But the majority of them are energy efficiency contracts. And I think there is a... A goal right now to do a one-year extension so that we can do a formal RFP process through the department. Okay. But right. this is our first one uh, in compliance with the, uh, the the bulletin. So if there are recommendations on other information the board would like to see, we'd be happy to make those modifications. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I suppose as contract status evolves, so as RFPs gets issued, just uh, up indicating and updating that. that would be we, we will be doing this quarterly. Great. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, then we will move to uh, item K. Uh, it is the adoption of minutes. Uh, is there a motion? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Commissioner Katz? Aye. Commissioner Lair? Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Commissioner McGraw? Aye. Vice President Neiman Brady? Aye. Five ayes. Motion adopted. Okay, then we will move to L5, uh, and that is called Special by Commissioners Katz and McGraw. Are you interested in a presentation? Yes, please. Terrific. We have uh, Daniel Baker, Manager of Power System Contracts, and Dominic Sarule, Manager of Distribution Operations. Good afternoon. How are you? Uh, I'm Daniel Baker. We have Dominic here. Good afternoon, commissioners. <clears throat> so we have a slide presentation. I don't know if there's specific questions first or if you'd uh, like me no, to. No, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Okay. So this is the uh, yeah, amendment number one to the uh, contract number 106 for vegetation management. This is, uh, if we go to the next slide, this contract really, oh, so I do it. Sorry. So this, yes, you this, control this, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, sorry. First time up here. Um, so this contract really underpins all the vegetation management that we uh, do throughout our service territory. It's really critical to many of the things that we do. Um, it's not something I think we think about a lot, or maybe folks here do, but within the department, we kind of uh, assume that this gets done. But it's, uh, it takes a lot of work. We've got some of the folks here who, who do that uh, and administrate this contract. So it's a pretty robust program that's been around a while. Um, it talks about here that we're going to be adding funds uh, of 114 million 950 thousand, which is um, to add two additional renewal periods. And so, um, I guess a little bit of background on the way the vegetation management works and, and the, what we get for this money is, um, uh, contract or for for tree trimming can happen in kind of two ways. You can you can pay by the tree or you can cut as a lump sum item. And so, what we've done on this contract is we have 12 different sections in the north uh, territory, which is actually on the next slide. 
So we've got this valley region here, and then we've got the metro region. So you can see the colors kind of represent the items on the contract. And so there's 12 in the north and 12 in the south, and what we do is we trim one area per month. And so it's kind of a cycled trimming uh, across the territory to make sure that we keep up with those the, the regulate, uh, regulatory requirements about clearances. And so um, that's how that works. And then um, I just might go back one thing there. So yeah, so that, that, that sort of summarizes it. And I guess the value to the department that we kind of, our interest in this was, you know, we had a lot of precipitation, you know, record levels of it. And because we, we established this contract in 2020, um, and we are, you know, paying for this in a lump sum across these different items. The expectation was vegetation would increase throughout that. We were able to retain the pricing from 2020, so um, we saw the value in uh, extending over two additional years to allow that vegetation to kind of grow and then and re-advertise and re-establish a contract at the end of that. So that's that's that. So if there's any questions on it. Yeah, my question is a little more structural. So, as you mentioned, this is a robust contract that's been around a while. What's the benefit to, to the department to keep this work external through a service provider like TSK? Mm -hmm. um, and are we doing anything to bring some of it internal with our union partners? Where where are we on that sort of calculus? So I, I can start by saying that you know, I know right now we've got about, just to kind of give you the numbers on it, we've around 70 crews. About 75. 70 contract crews on property. And we've got approximately 25 uh, in-house department crews. So, um, so mainly a capacity issue, it sounds like. Excuse me? It, mainly a capacity issue in terms of the need to contract some of the work. It's been based on not having enough internal capacity entry. Yeah, we've got identified approximately 360,000 trees documented. And out of those, we trim about 60 percent. You know, probably 220 trees is what's getting trimmed every year, mm -hmm. and we just don't have you know the crews that can trim that many trees. Are there efforts to grow that area of crews? Yes, we've train got a, yeah, we've established a new training program, which is in the works right now. How quickly are those ramping up? Do we expect to see this balance between the 70 external, 25 internal shift, and over what period of time? Hopefully, and I could not tell you right now. Like says, we're still in the getting the training program on board. So, one thing I could add, we've we've negotiated a new classification for utility tree trimmer, and one of the problems is being able to trim around around power power wires and so it's been difficult to be able to to take transfers or hire people who have the skill set um, i turn out we went to city and i know the eerc i believe is approved i'm not sure if it's gone to council or not to establish a new class so this will give us a new avenue by which to hire more people of our own and train them appropriately so they can do the work safely but it is it is a different kind of person than does regular tree trimming so that's one of the challenges i remember and, that from one of our yeah. my first meetings that that was an item yeah yes. and i wanted to raise a different issue since we had biodiversity as a topic today mm -hmm. um so as commissioner lehrer mentioned earlier trees and tree care play an important role in our local biodiversity i have a lot of experience on the tree care side as well from my role at ucla and facilities and tree risk management, um, so I have a lot of empathy for the scale of task ahead. I recognize that given the number and volume of trees that we're trimming, that we can't follow best practice in terms of trimming only outside of nest season. It has to be year round. But there are best practices and training um, out there for arborists, wildlife training. Um, so I don't want to hold up the contract, but I'd like to meet with you and find out if our existing contractors have any wildlife trained arborists or what their process is for nest surveys, et cetera, and see if we can't up that in future contracts or working with the company to make sure that they are following best practice in terms of tree care for birds and wildlife. That's a great recommendation. And We'll definitely follow up. Uh, I, yeah, I, if you email me, Commissioner Katz at LADWP, I have a couple resources and guides and training things that I can send you that we can um, emphasize we'd like this company to engage. And hopefully in the future that could be written into a contract. Yeah, mm -hmm. will do. Um, I'd like to point out that, um, and thank you for the presentation. I actually was very curious what the colors meant on, oh. uh, is that a, it's, 
Yeah. Yeah, it, so they, they just have, um, a lot, there's a lot of work that goes into maintaining the inventory of the trees. So all 360,000 trees are actually in a trim book. Mm -hmm. And so they keep track of these into these different geographical sections. So there's 173 sections and then they're grouped into these items. So all those dark green ones are one item on the contract. And so um, they can, yeah, so every month they do a trim patrol before they trim it, then they trim it, then they go after. So it's. It's a very well organized and methodical process okay. to do that. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I I have mentioned in the past that I've been on. Um, I like I like alleys for some reason. I <laughs> I like driving on alleys. I know alleys, and I was recently on uh, on several in in a re area in near Pan Pacific Park. And it is really scary to see the trees sort of, you know, on, you know, really creeping up into the po the poles that are not in good shape. Because I would imagine that also has to do with your equ equation. Um, so I would really like for you, you know, for for one to consider or bring up the fact that that alleys are streets and people use them, right? Um, and the other is schools. And I don't know who trims this public school, you know. So if, if it was near power, if there's power lines here and it's part of our clearances, then it would be it would be us. Okay, if it's our power it would lines. be you. Oh, I've been bringing one, a few up in schools that I drive by. I'll send you a list. I just wonder um, more on your behalf than anything else, but it happens to be the neighborhood we live in too, and I can just imagine something happening. So, um, but uh, I, I do think it's something to coordinate with the school district, because I don't know that we need to be responsible for the whole of the school district, my largest landowner in the city. But I think it's important in terms of just the urban forest and what we're talking about in terms of maintenance and biodiversity, I think it, it's something to yeah. think about. Outside of the utility piece, which I'm sure they'll address with um, LUSD, I, I have a contact on the LUSD facility side if you wanted to talk with them about their tree care practices. Yes. Okay. Um, are you finished? Sorry. I'm finished. Okay. Um, so, since this, this tight item was held, I, I do have two questions that have been on my mind. Where does the liability for um, adequately trimming the trees Yes. Um, do, do, does Tree King take that liability on um, if they fail to, if there's some sort of um, interference with lines uh, due to a failure of their trimming? Is that uh, something that's taken on through the contract or do we um, exclusively bear the, the risk there? And, and then I have a follow on question if anyone you answer. So I don't know if I could speak exactly to how that would. Uh, Maybe I can, Julie. I can explain. Uh, the the compliance part is always the department. So we have to comply with clearances, and we have to make sure that we we are filing the required clearances. So between the 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 enforcement agencies and us, there's no there's no contractor in between. But on the other hand, we have contractual obligation with the tree trimming company for meeting the specification and complying with the uh, requirements that we have. Fair, fair enough. I guess the, it was more the expectation that they are supposed to adhere to those uh, requirements and, yeah. um, you know. So there is a pre-trim patrol and a post-trim patrol, and okay. that's part of that contract administration piece, okay. and that's very uh, rigidly adhered to, and so they've got very strict timelines on that, and the crew's got, you know, the vegetation management contract operations crew goes out and does that to make sure that, you know, we're not just asking them to, to do it and hoping it works. I mean, we're, we're And so do we it. affirmatively accept their, yeah. um, their post? Right. Uh, yeah. after the, okay. yeah. And if not the right level of quality or if there are violations, I assume there's something in the contract that allows us to end the contract if yeah. they yeah. cause violations. We have, we have inspectors on the ground that does the compliance with the contract terms and then we keep, we hold them accountable to make sure that they're complying. Yeah. Okay. And, and then, no, go ahead. I, I, have, I have another question and that has to do with uh, sidewalk, you know, issues, which, you know, are definitely not necessarily your responsibility, but at some point, is there an issue when the sidewalks are completely lifted up by trees that you are trimming? Is there a reporting strategy to, like, street services or something on your behalf so that gets taken care of? 
usually the trees are owned, any tree that's on the parkway is owned by the city. Yeah. So they keep track of that. But if we see something that's a major hazard, we'll yes. report it. Okay. And, and we, we maintain all the those conditions around our stations. Uh, we are we are ins inspecting and maintaining those. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, I, I was here when this contract was initially approved, and I remember we had a dialogue around it. Um, but my recollection is there was a discussion about potentially splitting the north and the metro, or the valley of metro. Uh, into two separate contracts. Is that something that you will entertain when you do a follow-on uh, procurement effort, or are you going to continue to do it as one? So it was it was advertised as the opportunity to be split, and if they were the lowest bidder, and so the lowest bidder was awarded to both north and south, mm -hmm. and so it's definitely broken up such that you know if there's an opportunity to do that, we we would we would do that, and you know there's benefits to having two, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it ended up being the case that. Um, the, the way the, the bids worked out, that it was one, one, one bidder, bidder, yeah, yeah with that subcontracting, and it's really good, you know, local businesses, all three, subcon you know, the two subcontractors, all 100% small business and local business, so. Okay, I would just encourage you as you get to the conclusion of this to, when redoing it to also, yeah. again, do yeah. it. Yeah, that's Great. our goal. Yeah. Yeah, Very good, thank you. One comment on, on the availability of these resources is because all the utilities are kind of competing for the same thing and the compliance issues, so. This, the market is sh shrinking when it comes to contractors that are qualified to do this work. Yeah. That's one of the reasons you see looking to add to this contract rather than starting out fresh because there's other competition out there for these resources that we see coming and we thought it was important to hang on to these folks. Yeah, we've seen that as well, especially with the increased danger and attention to fire. Uh, everyone's yeah. looking to do a lot of brush clearance and tree trimming, so it is difficult to land contracts of the right scale when you're dealing with a large number of trees, so. That, that and inflation is up 18% in the last three years, that alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Since, since we're on this topic, but I, I believe there was press earlier this year that PG&E cut their tree trimming program and because they deemed it ineffective. <laughs> and um, or I don't think they removed it, but they cut it. Um, I don't know if you saw that. Um, press, but if you if you did, I'm interested to hear if that changed your evaluation of, of how we go forward. So, so yeah, some of the reasons why it's valuable sometimes is things like you know other part you know neighboring utilities if they shut something down and we think they're going to be ramping back up again, which inevitably would happen right after all the precipitation if they shut down for some period of time. We think that they're going to have to work extra hard and pull all resources up there to PG&E territory. So that does make us consider that they, they over the last several years even including the last contract we did they've, they've been retooling and looking at doing unit pricing paying by the tree paying by the lump sum and they've been trying to find the right balance of that and I think that might have played into why they re advertise we've been pretty consistently doing our lump sum I think they might be going back to more lump sum uh, to do that so uh, but I don't I you know there's that's a bit of detail I, I heard from someone at pg &E that in spite of the sound like they were gonna rely on their undergrounding and get rid of the tree trimming program and it undergrounding is a number of years off and I think yeah well, same they just as went back the on the underground yeah. tree trimming programs a number of years off too in reality yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was more yeah. of a sound bite than an actual business practice. Yeah, that's. <laughs> um, I guess my interest in this contract and several, you know, contracts like these really go to the amount of money that we're pumping into the local mm -hmm. economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want to revisit the, the question around our own crews. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems to me that I mean, there's that we're making decisions about what we want to do in-house and what we want to contract out. I mean, this isn't some great surprise that I mean, we have a tree trimming program mm -hmm. all the time. And to be as far out of balance as we are in terms of the number of crews that we have contracted mm -hmm. versus the number of crews in-house suggests to me a decision about how we want to do the work. Um, and I am uh, deeply interested in how we are leveraging um, money that comes to this, um, you know, this agency in a way that builds um, our local economy and that mm -hmm. builds employment, mm -hmm. builds the kind of or generates the kind of, of jobs for a broad workforce that creates a livable 
the opportunity to live in the city of Los Angeles. So I'm curious about, um, you say 70 crews. I'm curious about the secondary, like what workforce opportunity is being built by these dollars that are moving outside of the agency. Do we, how do we keep track of that? How do we, I mean, you've indicated, you've talked about you know, ownership, small business ownership, et cetera, which is great. But do we have any other um, mechanism for, for tracking and understanding um, how we are impacting workforce development in connection with, um, you know, something of this effort? I mean, $162 million, um, over a five-year period is not small change. No, that's true. So, so, I mean, I, I think your focus on the, the, the class, I mean, your development of that program for the, yeah, I mean, you talk about that a little bit. Or what's, what's, the, name See, the, wanna... what's the name of the program <laughs> that you're working on? It's, the, it's our training for the UL, ULTCC training program. <coughs> Renamed all the, you know, once we can ramp that up, we'll be hiring more local, you know, Qualified line clearance. Yeah, tree qualified trimmers. line clearance tree trimmers. Um, how that's going to benefit the economy, I, you know, I, that I can tell you. I just know that when we hire them, we'll be ramping up our guys and decreasing these. So these are, we're talking 70 crews, uh, two to three people per crew. So it's a couple hundred people. I think we're, our current, our current crews, DWP crews around 25 crews. And so there's a big um, opportunity to grow that. I know it has been a challenge over the years, as has as been said, about the availability of these qualified line clearance tree trimmers to come on. That's been a few years ago. We had a, a Senate bill that was passed that changed the, the way that they were paid. And so I think Aaron mentioned that, that um, you know, that's now we have, or, or Marty mentioned that now we've got a new classification that's going to be able to make that a little bit easier. So, you know, the timing of that, I think, is what you're asking for. And I don't know if it's possible for us to come back with the a better plan about that, about what that'll look like in terms of timing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I can speak to the exact timing right now. I think we should we should put we should put uh, the forecast of what the balance is for growing our crews, which are the tree trimming crews are the first crews that responds to storms. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones uh, basically clearing the work areas for the rest of our crews to mobilize and actually come in and, and restore the system. So um, that there is a balance for having that that workforce trained and positioned to respond to these events. The contract has always been intended for cyclical resource surges that we need to have, so we 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 don't ramp up to those levels mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. That balance is not there, uh, and and as as uh, Dominic mentioned, is we have the training programs where I think we owe you a forecast of when that balance is going to be struck by having those uh, graduates and the crew composition that we say we have arrived at balance. And then from there on, these these contracts will make sense for our cyclical uh, use of them for different season uh, you know, requirements. OK, that, I mean, that's fair. That would be terrific. I'm very interested in getting uh, in hearing that presentation. But yeah. I, I think, too, if I heard you correctly, we'll try to find out. I don't think we know the answer, but try to find <laughs> out more about the workforce that we are hiring through this to see how many of these folks are local, what communities they come from, how, how this company recruits their employees, because I think that speaks to this is money staying at home and benefiting Los Angeles you know, as we move forward. So we'll, we'll see what we can find out along those lines. I don't think we have that information I mean, they are yet. All, they are all 100. I mean, it is 100% uh, small business and local business that, that are on this contract. So we do know that piece, the specifics mm -hmm. about where it is within the community. I, I don't know, but um, that is sort of an unusually large number on this particular contract. And that's one of the reasons they've stayed down here and we've been able to capture them for the remainder of this contract because they, they are local and they prefer to kind of work in the area. So Perfect. Any other questions or comments? Uh, then I thank you. Thank you. Uh, and is there a motion with respect to item L5? I move to pass item L5. Second. Call the roll, please. Aye. Commissioner Lair? Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Commissioner McGraw? Aye. Vice President Neiman Brady? Aye. Five ayes, motion adopted. Uh, terrific. 
uh, we'll now have L6. We have uh, Normina Ruchich O'Neill, and uh, Manager of Resource Planning and System Res Resiliency, and Jay Lim, Manager of Resource Planning, to make the presentation. Good afternoon, uh, Board President and Commissioners. My name is Nermina Ruchich O'Neill. I'm a Manager of Resource Planning and System Resiliency. I'm here with my colleague, Jay Lim. He is in charge of uh, integrated resource planning and was in charge of generating the CCIRP report. Uh, we are here to present to you on a topic of filing of 2023 Power Integrated Resource Plan with the State of California Energy Commission. Uh, our um, few topics that we would like to talk to you about is overview of the filing, provide you an understanding of the differences between integrated resource plan to be filed to CEC and our local state, uh, our uh, strategic long-term uh, resource plan. Uh, also, uh, we will explain IRP reporting tables that are, contain required information as per CEC's filing guidelines and submission uh, filing guidelines. Review a current uh, renewable portfolio standard for state of California and its milestones. And finally, provide you an overview of an ongoing and iterative process of resource planning. Next slide, please. Uh, it's a you, little bit busy slide. Excuse but, me, mm -hmm, before sure. you keep going, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious, uh, is, is the presentation of interest to everyone here? Um, I did call all it special, but I, 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 I don't know. That's going through the presentation is not the reason why I called it. So if some, okay. no, I, I think it's uh, okay. It's important. Okay. Yeah, I think we have valuable. four and five, four or five slides, so it's not going okay. to be excessively long. Thank you very much. So I will start with defining what integrated resource plan is. It is long-term resource plan that identifies portfolio of resources requires to meet utilities' future energy needs at the lowest cost and risks while maintaining high reliability and environmental stewardships. IRP to be filed with the CEC is not identical, like I mentioned earlier, to our LADWP strategic long-term plan, which we just approved in July and it serves specific purpose. Jay will, in a few slides, explain that difference. And the purpose of integrated resource plan to be filed with the California Energy Commission is for the commission to utilize this data together with all other utilities information from their IRPs to conduct, assess how California will be meeting clean energy and greenhouse goals, uh, emission goals based on the Senate Bill 100. So that's just to give you a little background on the uh, eligibility and the laws that govern this filing, in October 7, 2015, Senate Bill 350 was signed into law that requires utilities to show how they will meet the state's long-term decarbonization targets. At that time, uh, re renewable portfolio standard target was increased from 33% in 2020 to 50% by 2030 with the goal of doubling energy efficiency of buildings and among other requirements. Publicly owned utilities such as LDWP with an average load greater than 700 megawatt hours were required to adopt IRP by January 1st, 2019 and file it by April 30th, 2019. And then every five years after that. In 2018, SB so you approved it after the fact. I'm sorry. I'm confused by the. It's you adopted. It's a, it's adopted. It, it needs to be adopted by the board uh, by fir January 1st of 2019, which it was adopted on November 27th, actually 2018. Okay. okay but so CC requires to actually just file and submit the report <coughs> no later than April. Okay. No. I believe it, it says 19. By, yeah. So I think you mean mm -hmm. 18. Okay. No worries. Mm -hmm. In 2018, uh, SB 100 was enacted in law, and in 2022, SB 1020, which aug augmented the state uh, Senate Bill 350 with additional targets. SB 100 outlines RPS goals of 60% by 2030 and 100% clean energy by 2045. The Senate Bill 1020 
augmented with the interim goals, which is 90% clean energy by 2035 and 95% clean energy by 2040. Updated IRIPs to be submitted to CEC should show how the respect, these respective utilities will meet these new targets. In terms of compliance, LADWP is mandated by this state law and the Public Utility Code Section 9622 to submit, submit an integrated resource plan to California Energy Commission every five years. Unlike SLTRP, the CCIRP requires to be approved by our board. Failure to comply with the Public Utility Act may result in monetary penalties. Sorry. So in terms of timeline, which I just mentioned earlier, in our first submittal, 2018 IRP was approved on November 27, 2019 by our board and then submitted by April 30, 2019. So if you follow the five-year rule, we need to approve this IRP, 2023 IRP, by no later than November 27 of this year and file it by April 30th next year. Now I will pass to Jay Lim to further clarify information related to this filing. Good afternoon, Commissioners. <clears throat> uh, so in this table, I wanna highlight the key differences between the integrated resource plan on the left, uh, which is for submittal to the California Energy Commission versus our internal strategic long-term resource plan on the right. Uh, whereas the CEC IRP is a mandatory document, which is stipulated by Senate Bill 350 to be submitted to the CEC once every five years. The SLTRP is actually a non-mandatory document that we voluntarily produce at least once every two years. The CEC IRP also requires board approval per the CEC filing and submission guidelines, while the SLTRP is generally presented to the board. Um, some of the key drivers th that drives the CEC IRP is state policy, meeting the goals at a minimum um, uh, based off of SB 350, which was later superseded by SB 100 and augmented by SB 1020. On the other hand, the SLTRP uh, includes both scenarios for to meet the state policy and local policy. Um, more often, local policy is more aspirational and uh, this last 2022 SLTRP cycle included uh, local policy to meet uh, council motion uh, listed here, 21-0352, and the mayor's directive. So as a result, the scenarios um, in the CEC IRP that we're submitting is uh, based off of SB 100. Uh, on the other hand, SLTRP includes um, both SB 100 and the more aspirational local policy cases, cases one, two, and three, uh, this was earlier presented to the board uh, back in October of last year, and we also provided an update April of this year. Uh, so the one of the key differences between the CEC IRP is that it's uh, a compliance document. So it, it needs to strictly follow the CEC guidelines, which um, the CEC developed uh, guidelines called publicly owned utility IRP submission and review guidelines, which uh, includes a list of contents that the CEC would like to, to review along with four standardized tables. Um, I'll, go, I'll get into the standardized tables in the next slide. It is, it is also reviewed and approved by legal. Uh, on the other hand, the SLTRP is uh, a collaborative development and I believe as the board knows, it includes an advisory group that consists of now uh, nearly 50 sta different stakeholders. Um, the last cycle we had 11 meetings throughout the, the development along with public outreach workshops and other ad hoc public meetings. And so uh, I wanna get into the contents of the CEC IRP. Um, <coughs> the bulk of the information that's submitted is actually data that we provide to the CEC. And this is in the form of standardized tables. Uh, so it, these, um, these four tables <coughs> that are highlighted here, the first is, is the capacity resource accounting table so we provide forecast of the net dependable capacity for the department's resources based off of the Senate Bill 100 scenario from 2022 through 2045. In addition, we also provide data, uh, forecasted data for energy forecasts for uh, energy, future 
energy to meet um, future load. Along with that, uh, the resource procurement table. This is an estimate of the utilities renewable portfolio percentage over time to meet the, decar uh, the clean energy goals uh, stipulated by SB 100. And then last, uh, we also provide the greenhouse gas emissions forecast uh, based off of the SB 100 scenario. Um, and the purpose of all of this data is to provide a set of data to the California Energy Commission. And uh, there's a joint agency uh, study going on right now, the 2025 Senate Bill 100. And the goal of that is to utilize all of the, the California utilities, uh, both public and private and investor owned utilities, and to aggregate all of that data to see uh, where California stands in terms of its clean energy goals and likely the joint agencies will be utilizing this data to prescribe future policies. So uh, this is a, a quick overview of the current California mandated milestones. Um, at the bottom, uh, Senate Bill 350, that was the origination of the requirement for utilities to submit an IRP. And this was really to show uh, how the utilities will get to the policy at that time, which is 50% renewable by 2030. Um, this was back in 2015. About three years later, 2018, uh, Senate Bill 100 was released, and this superseded uh, uh, SB 350, which uh, increased the renewable portfolio standard to 60% by 2030. Um, but the, the requirement to submit an updated IRP once every five years still stands. Uh, also with SB 100 in the blue, you see at the very top, uh, it also required a milestone of 100% clean energy by 2045. Uh, just recently, uh, last year, SB 100 was augmented by SB 1020, and these added interim goals, which is 90% clean energy by 2035 and 95% clean energy by 2040. In the green here, we have the more aspirational goals that uh, were presented as part of the 2022 SLTRP case one that was uh, presented to the board just to juxtapose the two uh, goals. Before you leave that page, I think it's it should be stated again how, I don't want to say divergent, but how uh, more perhaps more aggressive is the, the correct word the LA 100 goals are than, mm -hmm. than the states under this. Um, I do have some questions about how you model different paths or, or, you know, but we can get into that. But I think it's really important to note that we're still on track as a city yep. to be at 100% by 2035, not 2045. And so, so, so yeah, so d definitely th that is still the goal and we're working towards that. Um, the SLTRP is an iterative process. So we are kicking off the next cycle uh, early next year. And um, we will be, um, uh, based off of uh, market conditions and uh, and assumptions and uh, constraints, I th last I think last April we presented to the board some of the caveats and challenges of uh, SLTRP. So we'll be incorporating that, and then that will be that will um, feed into the next update on the SLTRP. And do you work on that too, or is that a different group? Um, both Nermina and I work on that. Okay. And I think in addition to challenges, we will also making inputs of opportunities, such as all these grants that we ha were started to receive that we applied, uh, IRA and other uh, funding that comes from federal and state that supports goals like ours. So it's gonna be a combination of constraints and barriers in addition to opportunities that will go into that next 2024 SLTRP modeling. And mm -hmm. just to be clear, to clarify, so for the IRP, it doesn't ask what the utilities goals are in a model based on that. It really asks specifically for this scenario. So you don't include the local scenarios that are more aggressive within the IRP reporting. That's correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. the the guidelines, uh, le it leaves it up to the utility which scenario they want to submit. And so um, we knowing that SLTRP, uh, we, we still have challenges to work through. Uh, we're submitting a scenario that is consistent with what the state law requires so more conservative. Do you anticipate that in the future we may update the CEC filing to include our LA 100 goals? Uh, yeah. So that's the goal. Um, this is this data submitted to the CEC once every five years. So, so we'll, we'll we'll have an opportunity in the next filing. 
Yeah, I think that I just want to be super clear and maybe help you out. I think that that our staff is always um, uh, deeply concerned with language um, that suggests we are, quote, an, on track um, because they recognize that our ability to actually achieve the goals that we have set are contingent upon actions that are beyond their control. Mm -hmm. And that our goals, which are being called aspirational here, let me just, you know, sort of refine that language a little. I think from the perspective of the city and this board, they are our goals. And, um, and we continue to take every action that we can conceivably take to hit those targets but it is an open question as to our success at meeting that 100% carbon free by 2035, absent um, the ability to address uh, what they've called constraints and challenges. And, and so um, the choice to use the more conservative approach as it relates to the uh, IRP is what um, it has been made. I think uh, it's in really important, though, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Neiman Brady, for highlighting the both divergence and distinction between the data that's being produced and what's being submitted to the state um, and what we are saying and doing locally. There is a distinction. There is a divergence. It is not a um, an abandonment or does not reflect a real a, a difference in terms of or a lack of effort or commitment to our local goals. It's just uh, reflects what is certain mm -hmm. <laughs> that they're willing to put their their reputation and names on mm -hmm. at this juncture. And again, their own discomfort with saying that we are going to be at 100% carbon free, mm -hmm. um, absent uh, some recognition and some solution to the constraints that they've presented <coughs> numerous times. And I suggest, I suspect we'll be presenting yet again. I think it's incumbent upon us and the rest of the city to respond in a way that allows the department to actually meet the objectives that have been set forth. And, mm -hmm. um, and I look forward to that. And I'm, and, and I'm confident that we both can, and I suspect will, um, with continued leadership, manifest uh, mm -hmm. those actions necessary to celebrate 2035. Certainly. Thank you, Commissioner President. Thank you. Okay, so I, I think Commissioner Neiman Brady asked a question about the modeling. Uh, so here's the, the cases that were modeled uh, for both the SLTRP and the CECIRP. Uh, so the modeling effort is a heavy lift because we're utilizing the same methodology from the LA100 study and we're p p conducting this in-house, uh, whereas we're using um, the same type of um, modeling, uh, capacity expansion, production cost model, resource adequacy. And so the, in the 2022 SLTRP, we modeled four different cases uh, within a stakeholder process. Uh, the SB100 was the reference case. Cases one, two, and three were to meet local policy. And this is um, indeed a, a iterative process where we'll be kicking off the next uh, iteration of SLTRP early next year. And the case scenarios uh, will need to be redeveloped with the input from the advisory group process. But for the purposes of the CEC IRP, uh, because the modeling is a heavy lift, we, we extracted the SB100 scenario and, uh, and the data from the 2022 SLTRP and uh, we're reporting that to the CEC. Um, okay, so that's why you're using 2021 numbers. I couldn't figure out why you're submitting yeah. for a 23 yeah. report with 21 numbers. Yeah, it, it's a so snapshot it's, in time. Instead of doing it again, you're... Yeah, exactly. Okay. Because um, not, not only is it modeling, but we have to gather all the updated assumptions, some of the assumptions are still in flux, like PPA prices and the uh, impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act, and we still have to build in the constraints. So that'll be part of the more robust process of the 2024 SLTRP. Okay, and so just following along this, that's that's also why certain, you know, generating units are 
deemed potentially out of service that may already be back in service, but because you're using the 21 uh, information. Yes, it, it's a snapshot in time for when the modeling was conducted. Okay, and then one thing that uh, jumped out at me was that um, the SB100 case, it appears, ex uh, doesn't incorporate uh, an assumption around um, biogas or renewable natural gas. Um, is That was surprising to me. Um, and I'm just, I'm assuming that the case we did for the SL therapy that was the SB100 case excludes it, but that if you, uh, our, our scenarios include it, is that correct? Uh, so with um, the SB100 uh, does not include it because uh, our, our last biogas uh, contract ended in 2018. And uh, moving, I mean, the, the SLTRP cases one, two, and three uh, was taken, was developed with input from the RISI group. And at that time, um, it was, uh, we did not have buy-in from the RISI group to include biogas. They, they wanted a carbon-free scenario by 2035, and biogas has some uh, product of carbon. Interesting. So we don't, we, none of our scenarios have biogas. Uh, yeah, for, the, for this iteration of the modeling. Okay. Okay. Um, um, separately, um, the, are the load forecasts the same? So uh, will we, yeah. we use the same load forecasts for this as we do for... Uh, yeah, so um, both uh, SLTRP and CEC use the expected load forecast, uh -huh. which aligns with uh, financial services load forecast. Um, and uh, SLTRP, we, they, we did run sensitivities on, on the load, high and low. But uh, for the purposes of the CECRP, it doesn't require us to include those. Okay. And then um, the, um, there's historic data on the system line losses that are in the presentation mm -hmm. that are not trending great. Um, what, what did you do for that going forward? And is that consistent with what you did with the um, LA100 cases? Uh, so th I, I believe LA 100 cases, uh, the lo line losses were in the same ballpark uh, between 8 to 10 percent. Uh, when we look at our actual line losses, so we, we query data from the net energy to serve load versus the ultimate sale, uh, the s sales to ultimate customers. The difference between that is lo line losses. Uh, for the last 10 years or so, we were averaging about 12 yeah. percent. I know it does look high, but that's mm -hmm. the total There's system losses. So it's not only distribution and transmission losses, but it's, it's losses overall. Mm -hmm. um, so we did carry that forward in terms of as a straight, as straight as assumption. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Very, very helpful. Very impressive work, by the way. The, um, this is, uh, I read it. Um, I didn't see any typos, which is unusual for a report of this length. Doesn't mean there aren't still in there. But, um, uh, this is a lot to do, and I know this is a re essentially a compliance filing, um, but it, it's an important thing to put out there, and so I appreciate the effort. I know it oh, thank a you. Time. Yeah, I want to express uh, gratitude to my staff, especially the Integrated Resource Planning Group, the Supervisor Robert Hodel, and Assistant Supervisor Mar Luis Martinez. They, they did the heavy lift for this. Uh, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Then do we have a motion to approve L6? So moved. I'll second. Uh, Commissioner Katz, absent. Commissioner Lair? Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Commissioner McGraw? Aye. Vice President Neiman Brady? Aye. Four ayes, motion adopted. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Look forward to seeing you for the SLTRP. Thank you. Um, then I, that concludes our open session agenda. Julie will be retiring into closed session. We'll go into um, the board conference room. You have the magic language to send us off. The board shall recess into closed session to discuss the items listed on agenda item M on the agenda. The board shall publicly report any action taken in closed session and the vote or abstention thereon of every member present in accordance with California Government Code 54957.1. All right, and uh, for those people who are joining us in closed session, we can retire into the conference room right now. Thanks.